Good afternoon and welcome members of the council and members of the public and those watching online to this extraordinary general meeting of the council. The purpose of this meeting is to decide whether to confer honorary alderman status on three of our former councillor colleagues for their long and devoted service to the city. Please note that the proceedings at the council meeting are recorded and streamed live to the internet. I now move on to item one, apologies. Have we any apologies for absence, please? <clears throat> uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. We've received apologies from Councillor Mrs. Aspinall, Councillor Hayden, Councillor Kelly, Councillor Lowry, Councillor Lugger, uh, Councillor MacDonald, Councillor Murphy, and Councillor Vincent. Thank you. Councillor Patel, are there any further apologies? We only have one from Councillor Bridgman, who will be attending a bit later. And Councillor Rennie, are there any further apologies? No, thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Declarations of interest. Item two. There is a dispensation in place that allows all councillors to speak and vote in respect of ceremonial honours given to councillors. So on that note, are there any other private or disclosable pecuniary interests in relation to the single item on this agenda? No hands raised. I'll carry on. Thank you. So this is for the appointment of Honorary Alderman to the City of Plymouth. Councillor Bingley, I understand that you are introducing, introducing the motion. That's correct, Lord Mayor. My Lord Mayor, I am honoured that it falls to me to propose this motion to bestow Honorary Alderman status on three people that have given so much time and service to our great city. Uh, the first is Glenn Jordan. Uh, Glenn was a councillor for 22 years, serving Plimpton Chadwood for 19 of those. Uh, and on a personal level, I, I, he, he served that seat with diligence and real uh, enthusiasm. I don't think there was any community centre that Glenn hadn't served on the board of or started or uh, been very much involved with. And not only doing that, but also finding the time here on council to serve in cabinet positions, many of them, and committee chairs across scrutiny and licensing. Uh, Glenn has played a huge role in his community, not just as a councillor, but also at the Chatterwood Community Farm and the nursery there and several other charities. I move on to councillor Ian Bowyer. Um, I only got elected last year, so only, only recently sort of got to know Ian, and um, just to sort of say that he, he was a councillor for 20 years. He did serve as leader um, between 2016 and 2018, and also held the finance portfolio with astute discipline whilst he did that during his time. Um, he, he served the ward of Eckbuckland since 2008, oh, sorry, since 2006, uh, and I, I was recently camp campaigning, canvassing around there. And, and he is held with enormous and, and high regard. And um, so it's, I'm very pleased to be standing up saying this today. Uh, just on a personal level, uh, Ian was enormously helpful, actually, since I became leader. I sat down with Ian a couple of times. And um, we haven't talked politics. We just talked about the role and the privilege of being leader of Plymouth City Council. So it's a real privilege for me to, to put this forward. Um, finally, Councillor... Ex-Councillor David James, who uh, I actually knew a little bit as, a, as an upstart teenager down here in Plymouth. Uh, David served for 25 years as Councillor for Plimpton St Mary and um, held seats across a range of council committees. But most significantly, he was a long-term champion of the scrutiny process. David really did believe that you ask those hard questions and you get the best answers as a policymaker. Uh, he will be very much missed. Uh, I, I served on scrutiny last year as, as a chair, and, and I have to say, David was a, both a, a mentor and, and an inspiration for me. You know, gave gave me the confidence to get up and running very quickly as a as a chair in a new, new a chair to a new administration. So he he will be missed, and I'm sure at some point he will want to attend and receive this wonderful 
accolade. My Lord Mayor, I propose that the Council confers on the following past members of Plymouth City Council the title of Honorary Alderman in recognition for their eminent services to the Council and the said city during the period when they were members of our Council. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much there, Councillor Bingley. Councillor Evans, I understand you will be second in the motion and I have no doubt that you also have a few words that you would like to share. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to you, Lord Mayor. Um, firstly, uh, can I say how delighted I am to see the back of those three. Uh, uh, three of the most formidable performers, uh, not just in this chamber, but in the committee rooms and in the back rooms uh, across Plymouth. Uh, they've all made a significant contribution to making this council better and making the city better, and uh, we're thankful for their service. I don't want to go into individual uh, life histories, you'll be pleased to know, uh, but I do, particularly with you two here, want to say thank you so much, and I'm going to repeat it again, for your involvement in the box. I think you two were ever present in the project from its inception through to its, uh, its opening day. And uh, your passion and enthusiasm and your commitment to cross-party working on this uh, made it the success that it was. Uh, I, for one, will always be grateful to you for that commitment and for giving me and Peter Smith the opportunity to be involved even when we were, you could have well left us outside shouting in. Um, and I hope you agree that we reciprocated uh, when the time came. Uh, but you did make that contribution. There, uh, again, there have been many contributions, and I, I would say again for, for Glenn and for Ian, is uh, they were always effective in this chamber, uh, never afraid to speak out, never, never hid away, um, and stood up and made points when sometimes those points were perhaps in the party interest, but not in their personal interest. And uh, again, uh, being able to do that and speak up on behalf of their constituents always. Uh, but I think, um, uh, turning to Ian, uh, I think Ian uh, gave real leadership to the authority during his time as council leader. It's the hardest job in politics, I reckon. Um, not just keeping the opposition happy, but keeping the opposition in your own bench is happy as well, is a, is a very skillful feat and one he'd managed to do with, with great, great political skill uh, and, not a, and, and a lot of charm. So thank you gents for everything you've done for Plymouth, well done to you on achieving this great honour and I'm, I'm hoping Glenn that you'll be one of those aldermen that give it back as soon as you've got it because obviously there'll be a vacancy in Chadwood coming up in uh, a couple of months time. Uh, so perhaps you'll think about throwing your hat back in the ring. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Evans. <clears throat> Thank you both. We shall now move to the vote to pass this resolution of Council to confer honorary alderman status on three of our former Councillor colleagues for their long and devoted service to our city. So please vote using your buttons on your unit. Green for in favour red for against, and amber to abstain. Gosh, that was a long minute. <laughs> the result of the vote, the vote is 47-4 and none against the motion. So the motion is therefore carried.
behalf of the council, I would like to offer our congratulations to former councillors Glenn Jordan, David James and Ian Boyer and look forward to the formal honorary alderman award ceremony later on in the year. We have two of the aldermen here with us today and I would like to invite them to speak. So, Alderman Ian Boyer, can I invite you to say a few words, please? Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. After such uh, effusive tributes, um, uh, I, I, I'm left with the feeling that saying a simple thank you isn't quite enough. Um, I'm enormously uh, honoured and, and humbled to, uh, to, to hear uh, such, uh, such comments from, from both the leader and the leader of the opposition, uh, and I, I, I thank them for doing so. Um, uh, in terms of my time with the Council, um, I'd like to just, if I could briefly offer some thanks first to all the officers who have helped uh, me considerably uh, over the time that I have been a member of this Council and uh, um, uh, I'm hugely impressed by the way in which they've gone about that task. Um, uh, I, I'd also like to thank you, Lord Mayor, and every member of the Council for the encouragement and the support um, that you have offered over that time. 20 years is a long time. Um, and dare I say, even I thank you guys on this side for, for, for the opposition um, that's been uh, aimed at me. I get that entirely, perfectly happy about that, but it's been done in a constructive way. And I think if I can just refer back to, uh, to, to, to Councillor Evans' comments about the box, that is the testimony uh, about working together, particularly on items which we know are going to span more than one administration. Because if we try and flip-flop all the time, it simply won't work. You won't get the funding in and you'll never deliver anything. And I think if there's one parting message from me, it's that's what I've learned in my time, is where possible or where necessary, work together for the greater good. It will always pay you in the long run. Um, I leave, uh, I leave the council uh, confident in the new team in Egg Buckland. Uh, they're able and uh, committed uh, 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 Linda Boyer, um, Chip Tofan and uh, uh, James Stoneman. Um, uh, again, I'm hugely impressed with them working as a team. Uh, they've got the message loud and clear and um, uh, I'm only too well aware that um, I wouldn't be standing here or wouldn't have the opportunity to stand here if it weren't for the continued support of uh, Egg Buckland residents who over all these years have uh, stuck by me uh, and I'm enormously grateful to, uh, to them. So um, I part on, I hope, very good terms with everyone and uh, look forward to uh, retaining an interest in, in all your uh, um, uh, actions in, in the future. Um, I think we all know there are some significant problems and real difficulties lying ahead, um, but um, I remain absolutely confident uh, that the wherewithal can be put together to overcome those problems. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much, Alderman Ian Bowyer. Alderman Glenn Jordan, can I invite you to come up and say a few words too? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, my Lord Mayor. It's actually st quite strange being back in here at the moment because uh, I didn't actually plan this. You may, <laughs> some, some of you might not have been surprised, um, but. Like Ian said, it's been absolutely fantastic working with a lot of them across the party. I could say me and Eddie go back 20, the whole 23 years. Um, the first time I got elected, I beat him, and then he was back on a year later. And we've worked really closely together. I'm going to say the box. Um, what a fantastic project. I'm going to say for me having that original idea and then thinking how in heaven's name are we going to do this to actually uh, Tudor and Pete Smith turning around and saying, we'll back you. And then find it, and then, then uh, it was actually Pete who solved the problem that we had with the library. And then we turned around and said, okay, we'll back you. And it just shows when everybody in this chamber works together on how fantastic of projects we can deliver. And I think one of the measures that I'm going to say is the new councillors I would suggest that you need to look at is when you leave, how much do you think you've made an impact on this city? How do you think you've made this city better? than when you came in. And I'm going to say, for me, I, I, I was sitting down wondering what I was going to say, and I was thinking, well, we never had a tourism strategy when I came along. I did that. Um, the vital spark, a cultural strategy, strategy. Without that, we would never have had the box. And it's all these things that you get involved. I'm going to say, Devonport Guildhall. 
I'm going to say, I, I, I'm going to say um, Labour got the funding for that, and then suddenly we took control, and I suddenly was saying, well, guess what? Your heritage and culture, that's on your doorstep. What are you going to do with it? And I'm going to say, I'm working with the local ward councillors, working with the local community, I'm going to say that another award-winning project in Plymouth that actually will put the, um, Plymouth on the map. So all you who sit sitting here now, you need to think, how am I going to make this city better? And a lot of the work, everybody sees what we're doing here with the, um, with the sniping and pot shots at each other, but actually a lot of the work we do in the committee rooms where we actually do get on is where we can deliver the good for the city, and I would ask you to, do, uh, to continue doing that. Um, I'm going to say, I will want, and there is something I do want to uh, indulge on, is I actually want to thank my family. My wife and my two daughters and my daughter's partner are here. My son couldn't make it. Because my youngest daughter, this is the first time she's never known me as a, as a counsellor. I'm going to say, um, she, I'm going to, so, yeah, that's the pavilion again now. Uh, and uh, for the whole of their period of their lives, they've had to live with being targeted, being abused, or hearing snidey comments about their dad. And it's not acceptable, and I know I've spoken to Eddie about this, um, and because some of those people should have known better, but others of those people, and they never once complained. They never once came and said, Dad, stop doing that, because... And actually, from speaking to some of their friends, they have stuck up for me, and they've stuck up for the work that we've been doing because they knew that that's what I believed in and it was the right thing. We argue about politics. They don't agree with me on a lot of things. But that, I think, is the right thing. It's never personal. Politics is not personal. It's about coming up with the right solution for a problem. And unfortunately, I think there's too many people who are seeing this as now it's making this personal. It's about personal opinion rather than actually what's the right result. And because... The political ideology just means that you want to do something slightly different. Neither of them are wrong, neither of them are right. It's which one is the one that's actually going to deliver the right result. And I think we've worked across party on a lot of things in, in here, even stuff that I haven't even been involved with, but we've come up with a right, right result. And I hope that that continues, because I don't think I'm going to be allowed to come back. So, but Because uh, I think my wife's enjoying the fact that she's got me home. She's got this list of jobs around the house that need doing. And, I'm, and, I'm, and other people are dragging me off, so it's getting longer rather than shorter. So thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Alderman Glenn Jordan. Finally, I have received a request that Alderman James would like to reserve his right to speak at a future council meeting to accept the award. So please let the minutes reflect this and we'll accommodate this at a future meeting of the council. This concludes the business for this extraordinary meeting and we will now move into our ordinary meeting of the council. Um, Alderman, um, you are more than welcome to stay. Okay, good afternoon members and welcome to the meeting of the full council.
During the meeting today, I will make him rulings on process and conduct during the meeting and would ask council to abide by the standing orders and rules of debate. We all enjoy robust, respectful debate and no doubt today will be no different. I will, however, warn members that should I feel that their behaviour is appropriate and if successive warnings are required, I will ask you to leave the chamber. The warning, by the way, is going to be me looking at you over the top of my glasses, just in case anybody needs to know exactly what that means. If members' speeches run over the time allocated, I will allow you to finish your sentence, but ask that you to finish as quickly as possible. At certain times, I may seek guidance from my advisers should we need to adjourn. I will always inform council of what is happening and give us a time to reconvene. Um, we're planning to take a tea break around four o'clock and tea will be available on the landing. I would also like to take this opportunity to remind members that there is no local government equivalent of parliamentary privilege. Members will therefore be liable for any defamatory statements that they make. If you wish to speak during the meeting, I would ask that you raise your hand and wait for you to invite me to speak. Um, Councillor Penworthy on my left, my Deputy Lord Mayor, has promised to keep a list and to keep me under control to make sure that I get everybody up to speak who requires to speak. Please rate any points of order verbally. I will then pause the meeting to deal with the point of order. When raising a point of order, please state which procedure, rule or law you believe has been breached. And all votes will be conducted via the electronic voting system today. Um, thank you. So, item one, apologies. Um, apologies for the meeting, please. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. We have apologies from Councillor Mrs Aspinall, Councillor Hayden, Councillor Kelly, Councillor Vincent, Councillor MacDonald, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Lugger and Councillor Lowry. understand that Councillor Mrs Bridgman might arrive slightly late. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And there are no further apologies. Councillor Patel, Councillor Rennie. I now move to the move the agendas from the minutes from the previous meetings, of which we've had three. We had an extraordinary meeting on the 21st of March, which is when we gave freedom of the city to the Falkland veterans, the ordinary meeting on the 21st of March, and the annual general meeting on the 20th of May 2022. I propose that the minutes of the meetings held on these dates will be signed as a correct record. Deputy Lord Mayor, will you please second my proposal? Yes, Lord Mayor. Does anyone wish to raise any comments on the minutes? Nope. Thank you. We'll move to the vote now. Please vote using the buttons on your unit. Green for in favour, red for against and amber to abstain. Thank you. That was carried. I now move to item three, declarations of interest. Can members please make it known by raising their hands, please, if they have any private or disclosable pecuniary interest in any of the matters on today's agenda? My advisor will then take a record of the interests declared. Nope. There aren't any, so thank you, members. There aren't any. Oh, sorry. Councillor Harrison. Uh, yeah, a, a, a private. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Lord Mayor, um, a private interest in the taxi licensing section. And what's the reason for that um, interest? My husband is a, um, has a, a taxi thank you. license. Thank you. Right, thank you. 
I now move to item four, appointments to committees and outside bodies. Please can I ask Council to note the changes to committee membership in the order paper and agree the outside bodies as detailed in the report. Councillor Evans. Lord Mayor, I, I need some advice from you at this point. Uh, there's a particular item under here that we would like to consider separately uh, from the rest of the recommendations. Uh, I was wondering, could I have some advice on how we have a vote on, a, on that separately from the others, please? So, uh, Councillor Evans, having taken advice, um, if Council can accept the committee places, except for the Earl Trust and the North Yard Community Trust, because they both need a vote, then what we will do, we will split those two votes and have a vote on the Earl Trust and then have another vote on the North Yard Community Trust. Thank you. Well, we're on a point of order in relation to the appointment and, and now a debate on the North Yard Community Trust. I would like to declare an interest on that item because there is a relationship between the, North, the, the incineration, incinerator and Babcock. And as an employee of Babcock, I'll, I'll declare a pecuniary interest. So I wouldn't want to be party to any debate on the representation. Thank you, Councillor Nichols. Noted. Okay, so the process will be, I'm now going to ask the Deputy Lord Mayor to note and to second the motion, except for those two things, so that all other things will be passed and we can just pass that through and then we'll have two votes, one on the Earl Trust and one on the North Yard Community Trust. Yeah, I'm moving the motion first. Are you, hope, are you happy to second Councillor Pembroke? I second that. Lord Mayor. Um, Lord Mayor, please can I ask for a point of order and some clarification on the Earl Trust vote. Um, the Earl Trust terms of reference quite clearly says that it has to be two Plimpton Earl councillors that sit on that trust, and which I'm one of those councillors. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Beer. That is correct, and that is what we're voting on. I'm going to ask my advisor to jump in just on the process now. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, so the proposal on the floor currently is from the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Lord Mayor, which is to accept the changes to committees as set out in the order paper. Um, these are the changes that are uh, advised to us by political groups and respective committees already appointed to. Uh, we'll move in a moment to two votes, one on the L Trust and one on the North Yard Community Trust. Neither of these trusts were appointed to at the AGM, which means that we are required to vote on them today. And following uh, intervention from Council Evans, we'll take those votes separately. Um, Lord Mayor, could I suggest that we start with the old trust fund? Would you like to propose a sound no agenda papers? So uh, the Earl Trust Fund, as set out in the order papers, to vote to agree the listed membership. Councillor Pembo, were you second? I'll second that, Lord Mayor. We now move to the vote. Councillor Evans. Apologies, I, I just w wish to get some clarification on Councillor Beer's point. Is Councillor Beer saying that the proposition that has been put forward now is not in order, or is it out of order? <coughs> it's in order. 
Uh, so, councillors, we'll move to the vote on the Old Trust Fund as set out in your agenda papers. That was carried four to six four and one abstention. Thank you. Now for the next vote, it's for the North Yard um, Community Trust as set out on the order parter. I propose the vote. Deputy Lord Mayor, can you second please? Yes, Lord Mayor. And we will now catch Evans. Yes, um, I was going to explain why I wanted a separate vote, Lord Mayor. Uh, I want a separate vote because I think the process for nominations on this one is flawed and I'm using that on the basis of the Nolan principles because the nomination was arrived at on the recommendation of a person who actually has a conflict of interest in my view as a member of the trust and a beneficiary of money from the trust, his organisation. And so I don't think the council should be nominating on that basis. I think the person making the recommendations today should have recused themselves from the process so we've got a clear conflict of interest. Uh, so I'm looking today not to object to the person that is chosen. I don't wish to do that. What I wish to do is to, is to oppose the process by which the persons making the nomination have been allowed to be part of this process. You cannot, can you, in all honesty with the Nolan principles, say that it's open and transparent to nominate somebody when you yourself could well be the beneficiary of their activity. It means potentially that they may feel they owe you a favor in some way and may act in that way. I have no reason to suspect that the nominee would do that. The point is, in terms of Nolan, that this is the kind of thing that Nolan seeks to stop. It is the sniff of it rather than the letter of it. And in this case, there's a very powerful aroma, and it's not coming from the incinerator this time. It's coming from this particular process. So I had hoped at this point, because we've been trying to sort this out for a few weeks now, that the Count Conservatives will have understood the Nolan Principles and therefore recused themselves from this. But they've refused to do that and continue to power through. And as long as that happens, I think there'll be a taint over this particular nomination. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Patel, did you wish to respond? Thank you, Lord Mayor. So I, I, I think what uh, Councillor Tudor is alluding to is, is the fact that I am on the trust. I also am an employee of an organisation within Palm Bar. Uh, but let me be very clear that apart from the very first year when I was not a councillor, my organisation has not applied to and has no intentions of applying to the North Yard Community Trust for any funds. And I think Councillor Tudor knows that. Before I speak, are there any further speakers? Um, one thing I think I will say as Lord Mayor is that I do think it is up to members to declare an interest, but I'm very mindful of the reason why Councillor Evans has um, questioned the process that is followed. So, 
can I, for now, move to the vote, but also, at the same time, can I ask for a legal monitoring officer to look at this process more clearly and make sure that in the future, or if we have to go back on what we're voting on today, we have a legal basis to make sure that declarations of interest are really, really open. Um, I'm not sure that um, to have a full debate on the chamber today will move that forwards. So, Councillor Evans, um, I'm going to propose that we move to the vote, but I'm also going to propose that this is looked at more thoroughly by the monitoring officer to make sure that we have a very open, transparent way of appointing people to committees. Lord Mayor, in, in bringing any proposal to this council, the uh, monitoring officer will always consider the matters in advance. Um, Councillor Evans has raised, raised some issues with the monitoring officer, um, and the monitoring officer will uh, reply to Councillor Evans. She can copy the whole of the council in, uh, giving her advice about why she has uh, agreed that this is a, a suitable way forward if the council wish for it to happen. Uh, thank you, Tracy, Chief Executive. Oh, Councillor Evans? Um, I, I wish to respond to what the Chief Executive said because I was in the meeting. Uh, she didn't say that. What she said was that my, my grounds for objection weren't right, which is different from what you just said. So I haven't had anything in writing from the monitor officer that says what the Chief Executive has just said because I didn't ask that question. Okay, I think... Um, in, in my remarks before the Chief Executive, I said that this should be taken back and we should get the monitoring officer to respond yeah. properly in writing, yes, about the issues that you have raised and making sure that our processes are open and transparent. So if you're happy with that, then we will now move to the vote. So this is for the committee members on the North Yard Community Trust as laid down in the order papers. Thank you, that is carried, 24, for 20 abstentions and three against. Um, I now come to questions from the public, of which there are a number. Um, the first question has been submitted by Mr Bamping. And the question is, does Plymouth City Council have a published policy for putting people on specific point of contacts known as SPOCs with the council? If not, can the council confirm that it is not able to put anyone on a SPOC as it would be unlawful to do so without a written policy? Um, I believe, Councillor Patel, you are going to respond. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. So in reply to Mr Blampling, I'll come back and say, the council does not have a published single point of contact policy, and I'm advised that there is no legal requirement for the council to have such a policy. Each case of potential excessive, malicious and vexatious communications with councillors and slant or officers is considered in light of the guard guidance from local government and social care ombudsman on managing unreasonable complaint behaviour. The Council has, however, undertaken a review and, and implement a single point of contact policy in due course. Thank you. The second question comes from, uh, many of the questions now following are referenced through to the taxi licensing policy. Um, the first one is from Mr Wildman. Mr Wildman, would you like to ask your question, please? Thank you.
Thank you very much, Lady Lord Mayor. Regarding the taxi policy, consultation was the only input allowed and ignored. Licensing officer report appeared to be unread, simply accepted. Trades and travelling public need proper input to decision makers before adoption. Consultation was broadly against. Democracy, it was a pointless paper exercise. Can Plymouth City Council reconsider the policy? Uh, Leader, I believe you will be responding. Th thanks, Lord Mayor, and thanks, Mr Wildman, for asking the question. Um, there was a pre-consultation with the PLTA and members of the taxi trade and a number of private hire operators. Uh, this was followed by a 12-week consultation and the feedback questionnaire was made available online to encourage more people to respond. Uh, a total of 338 responses were received, which is much higher than the last taxi policy consultation, which resulted in 95 responses. The consultation responses were reviewed and the policy updated accordingly. The consultation responses and considerations are included in the City Council report dated 21st of March 2022. The policy and consultation was also reviewed by members at the Scrutiny Committee on 15th of March 2022. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bingley. Um, the next question is from Mr Roy Hamilton. Mr Hamilton, would you like to please ask your question? Lord Mayor, Councillors and Officers, good afternoon. My question is, will Plymouth City Council reconsider the mandatory requirement for taking payment by card? Common issues are no signal or incompatible phone, insufficient funds, card declined by the issuer, PIN number not known, and bank system inoperative. Trade representatives and licensees should be able to speak to and answer questions from councillors at committee. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, councillor Bingley, you'll be responding. Th thanks, Lord Mayor. And just so council know, I've, I've got a further six questions I'm going to be answering on taxis. So I, I will try and provide different pieces of information answer direct, but sometimes there's an overlap in the information that's relevant. So uh, my answer is, it, it is at the discretion of the chair of any committee to invite members of the public or other representatives to speak at a committee on any particular agenda item. A scrutiny review of the implementation of the taxi policy is planned under the Infrastructure and Growth Committee, and the chair of that session would make appropriate invitations to witnesses. Officers have spoken to a number of taxi and private hired drivers who have no issues with taking card payments. A large number of vehicles already have card payment readers fitted to their vehicles and have had these in place for a number of years. This not only assists passengers to ensure that they can get home safely, but it is also safer for the drivers as they do not have to carry large amounts of cash. Any costs associated with the card readers can be claimed as a business expense. We have been advised that some card readers provide better coverage than others, so it is important to research the products that are available to ensure that the best coverage is obtained. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, the next question is from Mr Smale, who I don't believe is in the chamber, so I'll read it out. <clears throat> The taxi policy is driving people out of the trades. Anybody who carries on trading will license from other councils to see York. The policy is ridiculous, overpriced, unworkable, removes income from trade. 42 years in, I'll be switching. Do PCC wish to cease delivering taxi and private hire licensing? And again, the response is going to be from Councillor Bingley. Thanks, Lord Mayor, and I'm sorry that you feel the policy is ridiculous. Uh, the matter of overpriced would be something which is dealt with by the fees review, which occurs each year and is set by the Taxi Licensing Committee. 
The fee for each licence must cover the costs of administration and enforcement, and the fees have not been increased over the past two years. Whilst we appreciate that there will be some loss of income due to some drivers from work, such as funerals, weddings and advertising, members considered that introducing a livery would provide a number of positive benefits, as it has in many other cities. Other councils have found that it increases trade as liveried vehicles are easily recognised by the customer, give improved customer confidence and lead to other vehicle proprietors getting their livery earlier than required. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from um, Brian Rogers. <clears throat> What evidence is there to suggest that the colour of a wheelchair accessible taxi, as stipulated in the adopted taxi policy, white and green, encourages women to be safer, given that private hire vehicles in the city can be any colour, size and shape, stipulating the words taxi or cab? And again, I look into you, Councillor Bingley, for a response. Thanks, Lord Mayor. As detailed in the City Council Taxi Licensing Report, as heard at full council actually on the 21st of March this year, the white and green design is bright and easily identifiable, and it is hoped this would improve customer safety, especially in the evening and nighttime economy. <coughs> when our last unmet need survey was undertaken, some 63% of respondents said that they would prefer to see the Hackney carriage fleet have a livery, and 65% of respondents said they felt a livery would help to improve public safety using Hackney carriages. The livery, like elsewhere, will therefore enhance public safety assurance and security assurance, as customers can be confident that the taxi is properly licensed and meets the necessary standards, especially vulnerable clients transported at night. The next question was submitted by Mrs Carol Beaumont. 243 taxi and private hire drivers have left the two trades since 2020. How many drivers do we have to lose for the taxi and private hire policy of 2022 to be scrapped? Councillor Bingley, it's you again. Thanks, Lord Mayor. The loss of taxi and private hire drivers is a massive national problem. The taxi policy 2022 has encouraged drivers to return to the trade by including a three-year return period without having to complete the knowledge of Plymouth test. The limit on the number of hackney carriages has been removed to allow free entry to the market, and it is hoped that this may also reduce the rental costs of vehicles. The majority of changes included in the policy have been to ensure we meet the requirements of the Department for Transport statutory guidance. All councils will be reviewing their emissions policies to ensure they strive towards the government's climate and emergency action plan, and we are no different. We have listened to the feedback from the consultation, and vehicle proprietors have, and they have eight years until they are required to meet ultra-low emission standards. I believe this was put back after listening to the trade through the scrutiny process that I sat on last year. Uh, thank you, Leader. The next question comes from Mr Martin Leaves. Licensees earn additional income through advertising, funerals and weddings. PCC livery policy is depriving licensees of this income and discriminating against wheelchair-using disabled persons, contrary to the Plymouth City Council Equality and Diversity Policy. A Growth and Infrastructure Committee is planned. Will licensee representatives be granted full attending if will be granted full attendance and participate, participation at the meeting? Uh, Leader, for you to respond again, thank you. Thanks, Lord Mayor. And um, I don't think Martin's here today, but it's great to have a question from Martin, who was one of our candidates at the last election and who is also, I believe, an alderman. So um, in response, we understand that we will have an impact on this type of income. However, after careful consideration, the livery was introduced for the positive benefits it will achieve. I can also say that there will be announcement in relation to the, the finance and helping that area of the concerns uh, from this administration very imminently. The white and green design is bright and easily identifiable, and it is hoped that this would improve customer safety and customer assurance, 
especially in the evening and nighttime economy. A liveried fleet assists members of the public to identify a hackney carriage that can be flagged anywhere. And they know that they have a proper cab and not someone perhaps posing as a taxi driver. The council's CCTV department have also advised that at night, a clear defined taxi color, such as the white and green proposed, will help with the identification and will support clearer CCTV images. The livery will therefore enhance public safety perception and security assurance as customers can be confident that the taxi is properly licensed and meets the necessary safety standards, especially vulnerable clients transported at night. It professionalizes the service as it has done in other cities across our country. And other councils have found that it increases trade actually, yeah. increases improved customer confidence and leads to other vehicle proprietors getting their livery earlier than required. We do have a 100% wheelchair accessible hackney carriage fleet to ensure we do not discriminate against disabled persons. And again, this came up in scrutiny and it was something the entire committee looked at, was fully committed to. The taxi policy will be reviewed by scrutiny post implementation. That's something again that we agreed last year through scrutiny and members of the trade will be invited to take part in that session when it is scheduled. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Leader. The final question is from Mrs Wildman, and it says, the argument that livery adds CCTV identification is farcical. To identify private hire vehicles, it may be needed, but taxes are easy to differentiate. Can the requirement for unlicensed hackney carriages please be re-evaluated? Leader, you again. No. The white and green design is bright and easily identifiable, and it is hoped that this would improve customer safety, especially in the evening and nighttime economy. So I, I politely disagree with Mrs. Wildman. A liveried fleet assists members of the public to identify a hackney carriage that can be flagged anywhere, and they know that they have proper cab and not somebody potentially posing as a taxi driver. The council's CCTV department have also advised that at night, a clear defined taxi color and branding, such as the white and green proposed, will, will help with identification and spotting and will support clearer CCTV images. The livery, in our view, will therefore enhance public safety and security, as customers can be confident that the taxi is properly licensed and meets the necessary safety standards especially vulnerable clients being transported at night. We feel it professionalises the service and other councils have found that it increases trade as customers easily recognise the vehicle. Thank you. Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, councillors. So that brings us to the end of public questions. I now move on to announcements. Um, I have a few announcements and updates I would like to make myself in the first instance. Um, this is a little bit of self-promotion of myself and the Deputy Lord Mayor, so I'm not going to shy away from it. I was given permission to do this by my chaplain when he spoke to me before I took on the role. I just want to say thank you to everybody who participated in Lord Mayor's Day and the gala dinner. We had a really, really good start to the year. And since we've been out and about the theme, of the blue and green and protecting the planet and the importance of supporting the charities of Trevi and Gifted Women and the whole message we've been having around violence against women and girls, I like to say male violence against women and girls, has been very, very warmly received. Um, the Deputy Lord Mayor and myself did a lot of work around the Platinum Jubilee and I have to say it was a real honour that we represented the city for the lighting of the beacon upon the citadel walls and I have to say we ate quite a few cream teas and had quite a few pieces of cake as we visited at least 18 street stores as well as other church fates, churches and care homes and we did our best and we reckon we probably engaged with about two and a half thousand people over that period of four days. I think the other thing I would like to say and it links in with just a little bit of promotion for Armed Forces Day on Saturday 
we've done a lot of commemorative events for the Falklands. And you recall that we have made um, Plymouth and we've given Freedom of the City for Falkland veterans. So there's going to be a big parade on Saturday. But I think what I have picked up is just the emotional um, support for veterans and actually for people in Plymouth who were there when, during the conflict and for from people from the dockyard who supported the conflict. And I just wanted to say that, you know, what the City Council did by recognising this and putting on all the events has been very, very, very well received. Um, I also would like to say goodbye to someone. Um, Alison Botham, who has been Director for Children's Services for over... Well, she spent 30 years working within our um, at, at Children's Social Services. Um, she's now retiring. She took up the post of Assistant Director for Children's Social Care in 2013, when she relocated from London. And in March 2018, took up the post of Director of Children's Services. And we did, for a short time, have responsibility for both Tall Bay and Plymouth. Um, Alison is a determined champion for Plymouth children and young people, and we were sorry to see her go. And can I just ask for a round of applause, please, for councillors, just to show appreciation for Alison and her work. <laughs> and just as a little welcome, because as we know, um, children's services is a big part of the work that we deliver and takes a considerable amount of our budget. Um, I would also like just to welcome Sharon Muldoon, who's joined us today, who's sitting in the, the back of the chamber, who's going to be our new Director for Children's Services. Um, Sharon's joining us from Dorset Council. Uh, prior to her time at Dorset, Sharon was the Deputy Director of Children's Service at Northamptonshire Council and has various leadership roles. So we welcome Sharon to the authority. So welcome. And my last announcement before I hand over. Um, we've had an honours list announced, um, part of the Queen's Jubilee celebrations, and I'm very pleased to say that we have four people who have received nominations and gongs. And I'm going to read all of them out, because apparently we don't normally do BEMs, but I'm going to do both, because it's really nice, and I hate to say this, being an out-and-out -out feminist, to have four female names listed in front of me. So the gongs went to Jane Jones, who got an MBE, Alex Bowater, who got an OBE, Charlotte Murray, who got a BEM, and Lieutenant Commander Carol Rushley, who also got a BEM. So can we just give a quick round of applause to say well done. Right, leader and cabinet announcements. Leader, have you got anything you would like to announce? Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, just, just three or four. So firstly, on the cost of living, um, we know that many people are really worrying about the cost of living. Uh, you've seen uh, US interest rates go up substantially early last week. Uh, we want to make it easy as possible for people to find out all the support that is available here in Plymouth. So I've asked that we have a new online hub with signposts ranging from welfare benefits, like universal credit, to uh, just anything around sort of bills, electricity bills, support, that, that kind of thing. Uh, council tax support, housing costs, how to access food banks, uh, how to contact voluntary organisations, put it all together in an online hub. Um, we, we have called that, or you will find it as www.plymouth.gov.uk forward slash cost of living, and it should at the moment be on the front of the website anyway, if you, if you go onto the website. Uh, and then we will promote various sort of social media accounts related to those services. I'd just say to all councils, please get involved with that and cascade that out far and wide to your, to your residents. Thank you. Uh, we, we have some exciting news around Plymouth and the South Devon Freeport. Um, I'm excited to give you this update. Uh, along with our partners, actually, we've made incredible progress over the past three months and now have a date for our Freeport to be laid before Parliament via a statutory instrument. Just remind people why it matters. The Freeport business case models 3,854 new jobs, most of them higher value jobs, over the next 25 years in our key sectors of marine, advanced manufacturing and defence. These are higher value jobs with 2,745 being modelled to be well above the average wage. The Freeport will bring together over 100 hectares of employment land a 
across three tax sites at South Yard, Langage, and Sherford Employment Zone. We will receive some £25 million in grant funding, matched by £29 million from other partners to unlock these sites. And this will include a new £30 million innovation centre at Ocean's Gate. Overall, we estimate that the Freeport will unlock £250 million, a quarter of a billion pounds, of private sector investment. So where have we got to? In May, we submitted a full business case to the Department for Leveling Up Communities and completed all of the legal agreements for our Freeport. In the end, we completed five major deals in the space of five working days. And I can't thank the economic development team enough who were personally driving around and literally banging through meetings doors, uh, holding people to account that said they would sign on the dotted line in time before. It, it has been an incredible achievement by that team, by the person leading that team. So we've now created a Freeport company which will manage Freeport with Mr. Adrian Brett, CBI Regional Chair and of Princess Yachts, serving as interim chair. And we're most grateful for him stepping into the helm there. We are working on a levelling up bid to support the Innovation Centre in itself at South Yard. But the big news really over the last few days, we have received notification last week that the statutory instrument designating our first two tax dates will go before Parliament on July the 4th. This does mean that eligible businesses will be able to claim tax benefits at Sherford and at South Yard. 21 days after the 4th of July. And Langage will follow shortly behind, and hopefully that will be concluded by September. Building on from that, I have asked there to be overall a port strategy for Plymouth and the coastline that we are proud to own here. Uh, there are so many potential bids and so many potential initiatives from private companies and from uh, government departments that we need to put those jigsaw pieces together in a coherent way and deliver on our priority, which is higher value jobs and delivering a net zero port. Uh, that strategy won't be in place uh, probably until the back end of this year, uh, but we've talked about free port and I'm happy to say that we now formalise partnership with Associated British Ports and with Brittany Ferries. And then we've got major, major strategic opportunities over at Turn Chapel Wharfs, Catterdown Harbour, at Devonport with Princess Yachts, Ocean Gate, Sutton Harbour and Mill Bay. Never before have ports been so important in the UK as we push forward post-Brexit and with all the challenges that have been in the aviation economy that we need to look globally, genuinely, we need to look westwards and look across the oceans and make this one of the world's most resilient, successful ocean economies. So that port strategy will be in place. One of the centrepieces of that will be exploiting the $1 trillion market in marine autonomy. Um, we hope to publish that by the end of the year. Back to more granular achievements here in Plymouth. The Plymouth College of Arts has been given university status and makes Plymouth having three university status institutions in our city. That's an amazing message for central government and for potential investors here. So I want to congratulate Professor Paul Fieldson Danks and his amazing team at the College of Art on becoming the city's third university. Just very briefly, I need to acknowledge that a planning has been uh, passed for Plymouth City Council and NHS Devon, who've joined forces part of national NHS estates to develop plans for a new multi-purpose health and wellbeing centre in the West End. Plymouth is one of six pilot areas in England accepted into the programme, and it looks like we're ahead of the others. Uh, the population local to that health and wellbeing centre are some of our most disadvantaged, with Stonehouse being in the most deprived 1% of neighbourhoods in England. The provision, provision of this health and wellbeing centre and associated services on their doorstep is an opportunity to improve the health and wellbeing of this population in particular. And it will also have many, many wider city benefits in terms of predicted impact 
on pressures faced by University Hospitals Plymouth, in other words, relieving their pressures. The population living in the areas surrounding the planned health and wellbeing centre have levels of emergency department attendance that is 20% above the city average. So imagine getting this right and what it would mean for reducing the disparity of health delivery across the city. I'll leave that there, but in terms of just finally, I, I want to mention the success of four Plymouth schools in the last 12 months. Uh, we do have a challenge in this city in, in that not enough of our schools are, are rated as good or outstanding by Ofsted. We're way, way, way below the national average. National average is around 75%. But over the past few months, St Matthew's Primary School inspectors noted the pupils are happy and have a strong sense of belonging and that they are, quote, no limits placed on what pupils can achieve. The report goes on to describe an ambitious curriculum that gives the pupils the knowledge they need to be successful. At Knoll Primary School, the school's inspection report describes a school where pupils are proud of and enjoy their school. The report goes on to comment on how, quote, staff have high expectations of pupils' behaviour, and that, quote, the curriculum is well organised so that pupils develop their knowledge and skills well. At Lipson's Cooperative Academy, inspectors noted that, quote, pupils respond well to the high expectations that staff have of their behaviour that pupils have many opportunities to develop as individuals and that the curriculum is thoughtfully sequenced across all subjects. In the meantime, I'd also like to highlight that our adult education service has improved from required to improve to the grade of good. So I would like to congratulate all school leaders, staff and everyone involved to make the impressive improvement and my thanks to them for their dedication, commitment and hard work to help the children and young people in this city. But one of our stated priorities is for a decent education service and access to that for all, ch all children in Plymouth. And we will soon be publishing plans to drive up our Ofsted performances under the new leadership within this council. Uh, therein lies my final update. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Leader. Um, do any Cabinet members have any announcements? If so, please can you make it known by raising your hand and then I will call you to speak. We'll start with Councillor Shea, please. Thank you very much, my Lord Mayor. I'd like to uh, continue uh, to share the good news because it's complementary and intrinsically linked to the words that the Leader has used. Um, the Mayflower Autonomous Ship, in a voyage lasting 40 days and conquering approximately 3,500 unmanned miles at sea, the Mayflower Autonomous Ship arrived in North America in Halifax, Nova Scotia, on the 5th of June 2022. I wanted to pay tribute to Brett Fanouf and his brilliant team at MSUBS and his partners IBM and many others who were also involved in this endeavour for arriving in Nova Scotia, not only was this amazing feat but of many technological first, but it also shone an amazing world spotlight on Plymouth and the amazing engineers, scientists that do their work here in the city. Moving on from that, intrinsic, sorry, inclusive 2040, Plymouth. Plymouth is holding a major conference this week, hosted by the Inclusive Growth Group of Plymouth Growth Board which is tomorrow. Inclusive 2040 will explore the current and emerging pressures on key sectors within the city. It will use existing data to look at what the future holds and where radical approaches are needed to move forward towards a more inclusive city for 2040. Plymouth businesses are being invited to take part in an event that will help shape a more prosperous and inclusive future for Plymouth in following the pandemic. As part of the city's drive towards higher value jobs, now is the time for us to rethink what we do and how we respond to current and emerging pressures on business. Lots of Plymouth's working age people face challenges in the workplace and this event will explore where radical approaches are needed so that by 2040, Plymouth's economy is thriving. In addition, ministerial visits. I'm pleased to update the full council that we have hosted two ministerial visits in the last two weeks. 
Firstly, Secretary of State for International Trade, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, visited Plymouth to hear an update around the work we are doing on exports, innovation and our free port. Last week, I hosted the Minister for Employment, Mims Davis, to find out more about the work and a citywide partnership that is doing lots of work to support residents in gaining work, in entering training and education through our own skills launch pad here in Plymouth. Both of these visits show that the government sees Plymouth as a high priority and that the quality of the work we are doing is finally being recognised. Finally, pandemic business support programmes. Plymouth City Council has put in place a series of free port support contracts to help firms get back on their feet after the pandemic and give entrepreneurs the support they need. These range from helping people into self-employment, guiding them as they set up new businesses, as well as supporting an existing businesses to looking to relaunch. Um, I am pleased to report that a total of 234 businesses benefited from these business support contracts, including 33 newly created businesses and 21 new social enterprises. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Shaw. I've got four names in front of me, and just to let you know that we have 15 minutes left on this session, I'm going to call it in order. So, Councillor Dreen, would you like to stand up next? Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. It's a relatively brief one, but I just wanted to update members on the progress we've been making on the EV charging programme. Um, as of the end of May, uh, we had uh, managed to install 308 across the city, uh, the installations. Previously, I'd reported that with that programme, uh, we aimed by the completion date of December 2024 to have an overall situation of 615 parking bays with, par with charges. I can now report that with the success of the £19.9 million levelling up bid for Woolwell to the George scheme, we will also now install a further 100 bays with EV chargers as part of the improvements to the park and ride. So that means at the conclusion of the programme, uh, we should have 715 EV chargers in sites in Plymouth by December 2024. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Dream. Councillor Wakeham. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank all the staff in my area, that's environment and street scene, for the hard work they've done uh, since I've been in this role. And uh, I didn't realise they were such a small team, but they are a magnificent team and they certainly get out there and do it. And uh, in actual fact, there is a report which uh, I'm going to read in brief. It's a consultant's report, and this is from January 20. Uh, two. And it says, Street Services has been at the forefront of the Council's impressive response to COVID-19, maintaining core Council services throughout numerous lockdowns. We have been impressed with the look and the feel of this city, which has been clean, tidy, and with a real sense of being cared for. The Council is already getting the basics right in many areas that are challenging to us, of course, and should feel self-confident about its delivery. Now, cleansing. The teams are especially busy at this time of year, as we all know, with the advent of the growing season, multiple events planned around the city also, and we had teams working around the clock to ensure that not only was the city looking great to receive so many visitors over the Jubilee weekend, but also cleaning up after such events uh, like the one big weekend on Plymouth Hole, which I went to, and I've got to say it was really fantastic. And we managed to also secure 60 students uh, in the big clean-up afterwards, as well as other volunteers. So, you know, that, that's tremendous to be able to get all these volunteers who will help us when needed. Sorry, Councillor Wake. Councillor Tudor Evans, have you got a point of order you'd like to make? I'm just inviting you to, uh, to ask Councillor Wakeham on what basis he's making this announcement about something that he said was a consultant's report into January 22, and then he's just referred and congratulated people on the cleanliness of the Jubilee weekend, which I don't think was in January 22. So have we got a consultant's report? Where's it been published? Who wrote it? How much did it cost? And who commissioned it? Um, I think Councillor Evans, the uh, Cabinet member, is just updating on things that are happening within his portfolio area. 
<coughs> Thank you, Lord Mayor. Can I continue? Thank you. Okay. Uh, we, I've said we've managed to uh, get all the volunteers to help and students, etc. And we do appreciate what they did for us. Now, Cabinet colleagues have been working with officers to ensure the city is looking pristine ahead of Sale GP in July and, of course, the packed events programme, uh, which we'll have over the summer. Now, I think going up on the whole uh, with you, Lord Mayor, on the Falklands flag raising, I've got to say it was a tremendous morning. And uh, I know that so many people who were there appreciated the look of the whole, the backdrop, and everything that went with it. It was magnificent. Uh, there can be no doubt, of course, that one of the impacts of climate change are a blurring of the seasonal change and an extended growing season, especially here in the southwest because of the mild climate. This continues to be a big challenge, as my predecessors in the chamber, and I know you're one of them, uh, Lord Mayor, will no doubt confirm. The challenge is compounded by the limited methods of removal which we have at our disposal, while the most cost-effective solution is spraying with chemicals, of course, glyphosate, uh, which the vast majority of local authorities do continue to use, incidentally. But we are trying to reduce our dependence on herbicides. Uh, however, we have mobilized a range of approaches, and our contractor will continue with a limited spraying schedule, although he has experienced staff shortages, which of course is a national trend. We have some of our own staff undertaking additional spraying. We have staff manually hoeing areas of high growth. Uh, incidentally, myself and Councillor Dream experienced this work uh, firsthand, having spent Thursday morning manually removing weeds around Tudor's area in North Prospect, outside of the shops there. So we've done a little bit, and we intend to keep it going. We have redirected some of our smaller mechanized road sweepers with special brushes to help remove weeds. We are deploying staff with strimmers to tackle some larger uh, growth areas also. We've commissioned our highways team to launch a program of permanent repairs to the surfaces of hard to reach locations, such as central reservations. This investment will reduce the need to send staff to tackle these locations and the headache of the associated uh, traffic management problems. Finally, we are purchasing some very effective mechanized weed rippers, uh, which will help our crews cover much larger areas at a greater pace. And they're particularly effective on the cobbled back lanes we have so many of in this city. Now, just on grass cutting, this is our second full summer of the revised cutting schedule albeit updated following ward member consultation at the end of last summer. This has seen some changes to those areas that have been set aside for nature and those that have just received an edging cut or a short back and sides. Whilst there continues to be some resistance to making space for nature, we also re receive a lot of positive messages from residents letting us know how much they appreciate our efforts uh, to improve biodiversity as demonstrated in a recent Herald article. Throughout the season, we have invested officer time in running a comms campaign around this, supported by our partners, to promote and help residents understand the approach. Our website continues to remain updated, and crews uh, have been provided with leaflets to pass out to residents who may have queries. Councillor Aiken, I hate to interrupt you, but there are two people who wish to speak after you. Okay, and thank you, Lord Mayor. And you've only got the maximum stop. between thank the you. two of you of five minutes. So I'm going to call Councillor Stoneman first and then Councillor Patel. So. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like to update the City Council on two key commitments uh, regarding our climate change work. Uh, before I do so, can I pay tribute to yourself and to Councillor Bridgman on the work that you've both done on our climate change action plans. Uh, firstly, the 2021 Climate Emergency Action Plan committed to the Council uh, launching a Climate Ambassador Scheme to engage the hearts and minds of Plymouthians with our commitment to reach net zero by 2030. The scheme was launched by Councillor Bridgman uh, in October 2021 at the Youth Parliament Climate Summit. Today, I can announce that we are launching the recruitment program to deliver our 2022 commitment to launch this program across the city. And the details of this will be outlined on our website very, very shortly. 
I have also decided that I will establish climate advisors drawn from a wide range of sectors and partners in the city to help me drive forward the strategic climate interventions we need to meet our net zero commitments. Finally, Lord Mayor, I want to highlight some research that we have commissioned from Exeter University on progress with our climate emissions reductions since the Climate Declaration in 2019. Whilst some foundations have been laid by councillors Dan and Bridgman, we, uh, with the various actions set up in the 2019, 20 and 21 uh, corporate carbon reduction plan and uh, climate emergency action plans, the stark reality is we still have much more to do uh, as we move to the acceleration phase of our decarbonisation initiatives uh, to stand any chance of achieving net zero by 2030. I have therefore authorised the immediate publication of the Exeter University report uh, on greenhouse gas reporting and monitoring. This report shows the, that while greenhouse gas uh, emissions in Plymouth have been on a downward trajectory since 2008, with emissions reduced by about a third, the stark reality is that our actions to date have increased tenfold to meet our net zero commitments. So if zero emissions are to be achieved by 2030, an order of magnitude is now required. Uh, in the interest of openness and transparency, I'm therefore authorising the publication of this monitoring report to highlight the huge scale of the challenge ahead. This is also a call for action to meet the commitments of our climate emergency declaration. Thank you, Lord Mayor. You did speak very quickly. So, Councillor Patel and Councillor Mahoney, you literally have one minute each. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I did have two. I'll, I'll reduce it to one. Sale GP on the 30th and 31st of July. Uh, Team GB came third overall after the weekend in Chicago, just gone. Uh, and the event now comes to Plymouth. Uh, I want to just take this opportunity to talk a little bit about Sail GP. It's not just a sailing event. Yeah, for the city, it's, it's actually huge. Uh, in terms of uh, income generation, 8.9 million came in last year, and we expect to beat that uh, this year. Of, of that 8.9 million, 6.9 million was actually in the PL5 postcode areas. Uh, we had over 30,000 spectators last year, and we're expecting to, to smash that completely. Uh, we're providing a number of large free ticket events for those communities in, in the marginalised uh, areas. The other impact of this, that there's going to be four communities or four community groups, Nudge, Snapdragons, Albion Oaks and Albion Trust, who are going to be fitted out with solar panels uh, as a, in a partnership between Sale GP and PEC. Uh, and this year we have a new blue-green village with National Marine Park themed activities for families. Uh, Sail GP Legacy Programmes works with Mountbatten and the Horizon Sales Sailing Projects to provide sailing opportunities and RBI qualifications for our young people in this city. So Sorry, it's Councillor than... Patel, I'm going to have to stop you there okay. because I would like to give Councillor Mahoney one minute. <laughs> Thank you, my Lord Mayor. I have a report on the William and Patricia Venton Short-Term Care Centre and also one on the Workforce Recruitment and Retention Fund, but I think as we're time limited, I will get this email to all councillors so they can read it at their leisure. But I would like to say, in conclusion, uh, at this point, I would like to pay tribute to the 5,000 or so care staff in Plymouth who've worked tirelessly through the pandemic and continue to do so in all sectors of care. They are largely unsung heroes, uh, apart from the people who receive the care and the families of those who receive the care who know how valuable they are. In addition, we must remember family members and friends who provide paid uh, support in many instances. So I would like that tribute to be paid to all staff who continue to work with difficulties, high pressure jobs, um, big demand uh, as we go forward. And I will get the other two uh, reports sent on to all members. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Mahoney, for being brief and succinct. Um, I now move on to item seven, the Provisional Capital and Revenue Out Report um, for 2021-22. Councillor Shea, um, would you like to introduce the report, please? Thank you, my Lord Mayor. I will keep this as brief as I possibly can. Um, I'm pleased to present the provisional outturn position, both revenue and capital, for the Council in the financial year 21-22. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you very much to all the staff um, who have worked extremely hard, and the councillors, to keep us within budget. The report before the Council sets out the financial position for each of the Council's directorates and for the Council as a whole. The information is used to prepare the set of accounts for external order inspection. 
The financial information is provisional, i.e. not final, because of the audit process, and accordingly it is possible, as usual, that the numbers may be subject to further adjustment. Members will need no reminding that the financial challenges Plymouth has faced in the financial year due to COVID-19 pandemic. Despite this difficult year, the Council has achieved a balanced budget and at the position the year end. Given the circumstances, this is a notable result considering the solid and strong delivery. The Council is also aware of the financial challenges it faces looking forward and the balanced position includes carrying forward £9.4 million as approved at the full Council on the 28th of February 2022 to help balance the 22-23 revenue budget. As in 2020-21, the recommendations include the creation of a change contingency of 349,000 to invest to save initiatives in 22-23 or to assist in the balancing of the budget in 23-24. Appendix 1 details the COVID expenditure by each directorate and the grants drawn down to cover these costs, in total amounting to £17.1 million. Moving from revenue outturn, I would like to turn to the capital programme. The capital investment the, cap the Council has invested £75.2 million in the City during the 21-22, and this was within budget. Section 4.6 of the report lists some of the notable schemes and projects within the investment of the £75 million, and these include the Forder Valley Link Road and Interchange, £18 million, the Highway Maintenance and Essential Engineering, £5.3 million, Decarbonisation projects and home efficiency, 5.2 million. Strategic transport schemes, 4.7 million. Property regeneration, 4.2 million. Environmental service vehicles and containers, 3.1 million. Disabled facilities, 3.1 million. From this, the Council is recommended to. Firstly, note the provisional outturn position for the year ended 31st of March 2022. And secondly, note the provisional outturn position for the year, including the capital finance requirement of 75.275 million. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Councillor Shea. Um, Councillor Bingley, I understand you're second in the report. Would you like to speak now or reserve your right to speak? Thanks, Looks like you're going to speak now. No, reserve my right. Oh, okay. Does anybody else wish to speak? Councillor Evans. Uh, thanks very much. I just wanted to make the observation uh, C Councillor uh, Mark Lowry would have loved to have been here uh, himself, but illness prevents. Um, but I think it's important to know, and we'll be vo voting to support the motion today because obviously there's no point in opposing it but I think it's important that we do recognise the fact that the capital programme is seriously off course I mean they describe it very nicely in here as reprofiling what it means is we set a budget and we didn't spend it uh, if, if I if I <laughs> if you do that again why do you do that because what it does is uh, it means that you have to create the headroom in the revenue budget to pay for capital that you then don't use. So that's a bit pointless, actually. You spend all that time cutting services and getting all your back benches to line up to vote for it, and then you don't actually have to do it because you didn't spend the capital. Uh, so do better this year on capital expenditure. Uh, re every time you reprofile, it's an admission of failure. But I have to say, I think this is one of the lowest percentages of spend in year that I've seen for a number of years, probably the last time you guys were in. So I think it's important that we recognise the failure in this report, uh, rather than the sugared coating uh, presentation that we've had from Councillor Shea. Again, the legacy of being left so much COVID money bailed you out this year. Does anybody else wish to speak? Councillor Nicholson? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I could not respond to Councillor Evans because uh, 
it's just more and more of Councillor Evans' contributions to this chamber at full council are, are meaningless. You know, the late, late, can, oh man, la, late, late, Labour members Can we just be polite and respectful, please? Well, I am being to, polite and respectful. That I'm, goes I'm, to everybody. I'm being honest, Lord Mayor. The fact is that Councillor Evans wasn't respectful of the previous administration in the last financial year in the delivery of the budget. You know, Labour members over the last two, two and a half years have gone on about COVID and the impacts of COVID. You, Lord Mayor, um, used to use COVID as an excuse really to, to not deliver some of the frontline services that... Frontline services that people in this city wanted to see delivered. The fact is, Conservatives in this city have delivered £75 million of a capital budget. Notwithstanding the fact that Labour um, is, there's a shortage of Labour in the city in delivering some of those projects, uh, and indeed COVID has had an ongoing impact. So we should be congratulating the Conservatives who have been running this council for delivering a balanced budget which hasn't always been the case in this city, as Councillor Evans will know only too well, and um, for delivering a capital programme that delivered many schemes that actually wouldn't have been de delivered under a Labour council. So congratulations to Conservatives on this council for delivering a good budget last year, uh, for de delivering efficiencies within the organisation uh, and um, delivering some cracking projects, capital projects in this city. So well done. Right, Councillor Bingley, would you like to formally second, please? Uh, my Lord Mayor, I, I don't think there's anything more I'd like to add other than to say, yeah, absolutely, we're proud of the balanced budget that we've run. We're proud of the cap uh, capital projects that are bringing high value jobs into Plymouth. Um, so far as I saw it over last year, we had real cross-party working, actually, around most lines of the budget, and, and I didn't sort of hear this robust attack at any point in the last 12 months. I, I think it's a team effort proud of what we've done since 2021 and more than happy to send it to council. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Shea, would you like to sum up, please? Thank you very much, my Lord Mayor. I have nothing further to add. Thank you very much. In that case, we will move to the vote now. Please use in the voting buttons on your unit, green for in favour of the report, red for against and amber to abstain. Thank you very much. That was carried four to seven four and I abstained. I now move on to motions on notice. Um, the first one is ambulance response time and I believe that Councillor Lang, you will be proposing the motion. Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, before I start my speech, I want to tell you a little bit about my dad. His name is Paul, and I want to show you all a picture of him. Just have a little look at my lovely dad, sat on his boat. He's 82 years old. He had a very successful career in television and was the person who first put Lenny Henry and Victoria Wood on the telly. He produced and directed many of the programmes which you'll have probably watched, if you're old enough, in the 70s and 80s. I'm telling you this because I'm about to go on to talk about a night recently where he was really, really ill. And I don't want to be that, that to be the impression of him that you take away from here of an ill old man, because that's not him. He's a much loved dad and granddad slash grandpa, depending on the grandchild you're talking about. He loves climbing up things. He loves chopping down things. He loves sailing, traveling, doing wordle and lots more besides. But back to the night which prompted this motion and the speech that I'm making today. My dad's always been pretty healthy, robust, fit, active person, even given that he's over 80. But he'd been ill for a couple of weeks, 
and it was difficult to get him a home visit and difficult to access 111. But I'm not going to go into those issues today. What I want to talk about is my difficulty in getting an ambulance from the Southwestern Ambulance Service to him. <clears throat> I think it's important to note here that I didn't call the ambulance for my father. The paramedic linked to his GP surgery called the ambulance for him. They felt he was in need of urgent care at the hospital, and they told me if an ambulance hadn't come within an hour that I should call again. So we waited an hour, no ambulance arrived. I called as instructed, and I was told although my father had been classed as a category two patient, no timescale could be offered as to when an ambulance would arrive. So began almost another five hours of waiting. My dad was in pain and extremely unwell, and it became more and more stressful as time wore on. We received a couple of phone calls from a member of the SWAS team, very compassionate and kind calls, but basically telling us they couldn't tell us when the ambulance would come. What an extraordinary job to have to call distressed and anxious people to tell them the ambulance they're waiting for isn't coming yet. My dad kept saying, why aren't they coming, Mima? After about five hours, I called again because my father's breathing was becoming shallow and I was told by the ambulance team to source a defibrillator if I could. I ask all of you to think about one of the people you love most in the world and imagine them asking you why no ambulance is coming for them and you have no answer. I thought, of course, and in panic about taking him to hospital myself but he was in no fit state for me to do that. I made a very particular point in this motion. It's not an attack on the people who work in the ambulance service or the wider NHS for that matter. All the people who looked after my father were wonderful. It's not the care itself, it's the pathway to that care which seems to be broken. I've been contacted by a number of paramedics since I tweeted about this, and they told me they want a light shone on the situation which is preventing them from doing the job they all signed up to do. They don't want to be stuck in Derriford car park waiting to unload a patient who really ought to be receiving care within the hospital building. But this is the situation we're in all too often now. And what disappoints me most of all, that this isn't being talked about at a national level. Does Sajid Javid know what is happening down here in Plymouth and right across the West Country? Does he care that people like my dad and maybe your dad, your grandmother, or somebody in your family who you care about might have to wait in pain and anxiety for many, many hours before the help they should be entitled to expect will come. A report last week from the Health Safety Investigation Branch talked about how they've moved from talking about risk being posed by these delays to the harm being done by them. So from the anecdotal to the data, in the week beginning 4th of April, the mean response time for a Category 2 patient like my dad across the SWAS Trust was 105 minutes and 44 seconds. That's against a national target of 18 minutes. The Health, Service Invest the Health Safety Investigation Branch has called for an immediate strategic national response to address patient safety issues across health and social care. And I echo that call here. I wouldn't wish anyone to be in a situation like I was, where I'm unable to tell my dad the person I've always been able to rely on throughout my life to fix things for me, that I don't know why they aren't coming to help, and I couldn't do anything about it. I urge you all to support this motion. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lang. Councillor Tippett, I understand you're second in the report. The motion. Would you like to speak now or reserve your right to speak? I'd like to reserve my right, my Lord Mayor. Okay. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Councillor Pengelly. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with this motion and I listened very carefully to what Jemima had to say because I think each and every one of us sitting here can also tell a story about a family member or a friend or they've heard about someone who has not been delivered quickly from home to hospital and treated. 
Ambulance drivers work extremely hard to deliver their patients to hospital as quickly as possible, also to respond as quickly as possible when they receive an emergency call. The problem is ambulance drivers cannot deliver their patient quickly when they reach Derriford Hospital. Why? Because they are in a queue of up to 29, I've heard. Patients can wait eight to 18 hours. I remember being with someone at lunch and we called for an ambulance when he was taken terribly ill. He went at three o'clock. He was still in that ambulance at eight o'clock next morning. This is shocking and it should be improved. It's obvious that the problem lies with Derriford Hospital when receiving patients. Ambulance drivers want to do their job quickly and efficiently. One ambulance driver stated on television that he picks up one patient per shift. That is shocking. It is worrying for the patient waiting to be picked at, up to, and it is worrying for them to spend up to 20 hours in an ambulance before seeing a doctor at the hospital. Regarding Resolution 2, our Members of Parliament, our Secretary of State, all of them must do their utmost to help and try and improve this very dangerous situation. And I say dangerous, yes, because lives depend on it. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Councillor Frangeli. Councillor Mahoney? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I support the motion. This is an incredibly difficult problem with many facets. Part of it is because there's too much demand for ambulances. This is partly, I think, because patients aren't being triaged properly in general practice, aren't being seen necessarily elsewhere, and ambulances end up being called by people who perhaps don't need them, which results in those who really do need them having to wait. Uh, there's also an A&E capacity. We all know that the A&E department is the first bit of Derriford that's going to be redesigned and rebuilt, which should help matters, but not immediately. Staffing issues may also be important, and some bed blocking, although actually we seem not to have too much of a bed blocking problem, as my report, not delivered earlier, but which you will all see, will state. Um, it, it is very difficult. I, twice it, since the pandemic started, have been in the roadside with somebody who collapsed. Um, the first time, after about three hours of several of us attending, the chat was stable, the police were there, an ambulance did turn up. That was in the early days of the pandemic. More recently, a collapse on Devonport Road. Um, there were, in the end, myself, two urologists and a nurse practitioner in attendance. The chap did recover significantly and was happily taken off to the A&E department by a policeman but in his car, but this really isn't very satisfactory. The issue is that severely ill patients are not being treated quickly enough and being triaged adequately because the demand probably is too high, but it's the problem at the other end, as Councillor Nicholson and uh, Councillor Pengeli has said, uh, and Councillor Lang, it's actually delays offloading at Derriford Hospital. I hope that this is going to be addressed speedily. It is multifactorial. The answers are not simple, but it is life-threatening, in my opinion, for patients who really need an ambulance, who are severely ill and are not picked up, while other patients are sitting outside the A&E department for 16 hours, who presumably are not as ill as the ones who are lying at home unassessed. So I do support the motion and I hope I will do everything I can um, with my limited powers to try and ensure that these issues are addressed. But it is not just Derriford Hospital, it is a multifactorial problem. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Mahoney. Um, Councillor Finn, and I believe this will be your maiden speech. Yeah, basically I support what... Um, Councillor Mahoney has just said. I myself, as I'm someone who, who needs to rely on the ambulance service and its ability to attend a Cat 1 call quickly. And on that basis, I fully support the motion that's been put forward. Unfortunately, two weeks ago, I was um, in Derriford, 13 hours in ED, firstly. And I noted 31 ambulances stood outside, a general conversation with the ambulance staff and uh, some of the patients not just outside, but in ED themselves. And clearly, while they're there, they're not serving the public. 
I think what this motion does is, is opens up that conversation to why, which will hopefully result in some positive action. Because not only does it affect each and every one of us here, it affects the publics we purport to serve. Now, this is a very complicated scenario. It's not just the ambulance in Derrick. On, for example, that night, Derrick didn't have one bed free. There was three people that had failed operations that urgently needed to be readmitted. There wasn't a bed to readmit them on. Um, when I was taken down to resus on the trolley, I noticed eight trolleys beside me stacked up at the, in the side of the corridor, which for a 21st century health service is clearly not acceptable. So therefore, Councillor Lang, I fully support your motion and let's go as far as to say in health scrutiny, we are bringing these issues up and we hopefully will have a clear strategy to how we can make things better. Because clearly it's from triage, Cumberland Centre to Derriford, how it's triage to acute to et cetera. These are the issues that need to be looked at. And I believe we as a council, if we stick together, unify together, we can make that difference to the public. Thank you, Councillor Finn. Um, Councillor Coker? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I, I thank Councillor Lang for bringing this today. Last, earlier this year, Councillor Creswell and myself were in Devonport Park where a 95-plus-year-old lady fell. Uh, and she went down so big and hard that we stopped playing put on and rushed to her rescue. It started to rain, it got cold. In five hours, we sat there just waiting. I was so desperate, I phoned a council officer and said, what do I do? I'm afraid this lady's gonna die because she went blue with the cold. We, I phoned again, Councillor Creswell phoned, and we were told, basically, there's nothing we can do. If the situation deteriorates, phone us again. When you phone and say, you've got a 95-year-old lady laying in the rain on a hard surface, and we knew she'd broken her hip, what circumstances can change? Do we want to ring later on and say, don't come, we've lost this lady? But what I would like to do is pay tribute to the passers-by in the park that went to a residential home to get blankets. A young lad went to get a sweet tea. Although we couldn't move the lady, but actually the community came together. And I think what we're in danger of is losing community spirit and support because people were saying to us, there's no point ringing for an ambulance. It ain't gonna come for hours on end. And this is not, as someone else in the chamber said, this is not being talked about nationally. It is a national problem, but for all 57 of us, we're here to talk and speak up for our residents, and this is what we must do. So I think all 57, or however many of us are here today, need to show support to Councillor Lang's motion so we send a clear message that this needs to be looked at, actions need to be taken, because if it isn't and it continues to deteriorate, people will unfortunately ultimately die. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Coker. Councillor Lovebridge. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Today, I'd like to share a really sad story about um, a resident of mine, and also she was a loyal customer to my business. Um, in the morning, she woke up and she thought she had something stuck in her throat. Um, being that her husband and herself don't drive, as the day went on, it got excruciating. The pain was so bad that he just had to call the ambulance. Four hours later, the ambulance turned up. Nine hours sat outside in the ambulance to get inside that hospital to see a doctor. Once inside that hospital, another four hours before she could even see a doctor. But then when she spoke to the nurse, unfortunately it was another four hours on from there. She ended up to start actually going home, discharging herself. Throughout the day, 
she got worse. By the evening, she heard a crack, or her husband heard a crack. Her trachea, or esophagus, had literally burst, in resulting she died from this. And this is the sad thing about it. I think today everybody will be supporting this motion. I think, you know, if we don't, we must be bonkers. But this is a result of waiting, and it's time. Time is at the essence. So please, everybody, Jemima Lai, we will support you throughout this council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Leverage. Councillor Collins, and then I will call Councillor Tippett, because I don't think anybody else wishes to speak. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor, and of course I'll be supporting Councillor Lang's motion today. Well, I, I kind of related to it, I didn't plan to speak, but um, I related quite a lot to what Councillor Lang said, and like many of us, I have a member of my family who's in the NHS, and in the, all of the kind of months leading up to what happened, um, they said, genuinely, there's very little point in calling an ambulance, it depends what the situation is, but you might just want to hotfoot it. Anyway, I got a call, my, well, a WhatsApp message. My grandmother thought she was having a stroke. And when you're half an hour away and you're thinking there's no ambulance coming anytime soon, that is quite a stressful drive. And I hate to think how many people drove the way that I did in that time and the danger that it, that's putting in, let alone everything else. And then meeting my family member who's a nurse there and us just looking at each other helpless, going, what do we do? And we're very lucky that within a couple of hours an ambulance did come and it was kind of a positive outcome. But nobody should be in the situation where they have to have the stress or the helplessness or the, I have to get there by any means necessary because no one else is going to and potentially causing an even worse situation. So I just wanted to put that on the record. So thank you very much. And of course, we'll be supporting Councillor Lang's motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Collins. Um, Councillor Tippett, and I believe this will be your maiden speech. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. It's a real honour to be the first Labour councillor for Compton, Manamead, Mutley and Hartley Vale, and our region's first openly transgender councillor. I'm pleased to be giving my maiden speech today on the ambulance service, which is such an important topic for all of us, and I know it's a topic the residents of Compton Ward care deeply about. However, it's also quite embarrassing that I have to speak up about the absolute state our ambulance service is currently in. But it really isn't as embarrassing as some of the pedestrian and predictable responses coming from the benches opposite, as they seem to be forgetting it's their own party that have been in government for the past 12 years. Three successive Conservative Prime Ministers that have seen the decline of our ambulance service on their watch. So one of the pedestrian and predictable excuses that we've heard from their party in government is that the ambulance service is only on its knees because of the coronavirus pandemic that has been plaguing our country for the past two years. Now, it seems that some people find it easy to forget about reality. So I'd like to cast your minds back to the summer of 2016, where it was clear that our ambulance service was already on its knees. In the July of 2016, my nan had a fall outside of her home on one of the hottest days of the year. She was already vulnerable, yet she was left waiting for over two and a half hours for an ambulance in the scorching sun. I'd like to remind you that 2016 was six years ago. I was still in year 10 at secondary school. And well, my Lord Mayor, what has happened since then? Well, for starters, the former Secretary of State for Health has seen more action behind closed office doors than the ambulance service has funding. But it gets worse, my Lord Mayor. In 2021, more than 6,500 ambulance crew members reported they were attacked or threatened whilst on the job. This is over two thousand more reports than in 2016, with the South West being one of the worst affected regions. Our ambulance crews are just trying to do their jobs. How is this helping when we in the South West have some of the worst response times to 999 calls in the country? The public frustration is clearly rising, and it is up to us as politicians to act. So what can we do to help make this right? It's not the most glamorous of topics to talk about, but bed block is a real issue in our hospitals. 
or as some might say, the NHS is suffering from chronic constipation. We have all seen the pictures of ambulances queuing for hours outside of Derriford Hospital, waiting to get a patient into the accident and emergency department, and then back out to respond to another 999 call. Even whilst the government continues to sit on their hands, we can take some action to reduce the scenes that I've just described and are still happening right now as we sit here in the chamber today. Having watched the BBC television show Ambulance, I've seen that lots of 999 calls for ambulances are for people experiencing a mental health crisis. Since we are experiencing a mental health epidemic in this country, these calls aren't going to go away by themselves. Early intervention would reduce these calls, and it is Labour policy nationally to see more open access mental health hubs for children and young people in their local communities. It's by thinking outside of the box like this that we can reduce the number of 999 calls. This doesn't just improve response times, but it's better for the health of all residents in our communities. Because at the end of the day, we are all here to make the lives of our residents better. I want to pay my thanks to all of the hardworking people who keep our ambulance service running every single day. Whether it's the vehicle technicians, call handlers, paramedics, or many more, your service is not going unnoticed, and we know you are delivering your best in the most difficult of circumstances. So let's commit ourselves today to do more and give the, our ambulance service the backing it deserves. We can see the day where we get back to the status quo we want to see and have ambulances getting to emergencies in a more timely fashion. And more importantly, so we don't have to hear any more unfathomable stories of people not getting the help their hour of greatest need requires. Stories like that of Mr Lang, who is one of my residents. We cannot and must not accept the worsening state of our life-saving services. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Perfect time in there, Councillor Tippett. Um, thank you. Councillor Lang, would you like to sum up, please? Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. I want to um, say thank you very much for all the thoughtful and actually highly personal contributions to this debate from across the chamber. I'm glad to say my dad is home now and recovering well, and I'm grateful he was OK with me sharing his story so publicly in the hope that something might change. But you know what? When anecdote, when anecdote chimes with data, you know there's a serious problem. There's a number of reasons this is happening. Chief among them, the handover process, which we've heard a lot about, from ambulance to hospital, and the, difficult, the difficulty discharging people. There's also recruitment <coughs> and retention, retention challenges too. And the number of operational hours lost to handover delays <coughs> in the week beginning 4th of April was 10,598. You can do the maths to work out how many 11-hour shifts that equates to. That's what that car park full of ambulances you see at Derriford means. Tens of thousands of hours lost every month. I have a suspicion, and Councillor Coker alluded to it as well, that it's this government's plan to get us to start accepting the fact that we can't pick up a phone and call for urgent help and be guaranteed that that help will come. They want us, by attrition, to accept that what was once an emergency service in the true meaning of the word is not something that can be relied on now or in the future. And we cannot let that happen. We've heard many reasons this afternoon why that just will not do. I'm grateful that we're shining a light on it here in the chamber, and I'm grateful to Councillor Mahoney for his pledge that he'll bring what influence he has to bear on this matter. <clears throat> we have to fix this, and we have to have a plan. The Prime Minister talks a lot about delivering on the people's priorities. I can't think of a higher priority than this. It's time to start delivering. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lang. I'll now move to the vote. Just to remind you, please vote using the buttons on your unit. Green for in favour, red for against, and amber to abstain.
Thank you, councillors. That is carried. I'm now going to suggest that we break for tea a little early, because I think if we start um, talking on the next motion on notice, we're going to go way over. And can I suggest that we have 20 minutes and be back here at 10 past four? Thank you very much.
Uh, welcome back, councillors. Thank you. Right, our second motion for the afternoon is Jackets. changes to the planning system. Um, if you'd like to take your jackets off, Lord ladies. Mayor, is it possible um, we could take gentlemen. our jackets off, please? Yeah. Thank you. Just so, I was about to say, if you'd yes. like to take... I know, I just ladies and gentlemen. Jim Stanley, yeah. I was listening. I was there. I was there. Some echo. Some echo. I didn't hear her, too. I didn't hear her. I didn't hear her. So, uh, I know. You were saying you had problems with your hearing. Just you're not really sure you. Yeah. Certain words I can't hear, but I had a hear test about a year ago. There's about five or six letters, for some reason, they don't actually register in my hearing. It's weird. OK, I think you're all now sitting comfortably. No. So we now move to motion 8B, concerning changes to the planning system. Councillor Stevens, would you like to propose your motion, please? Thank you uh, very much indeed, Lord Mayor. It's great to be speaking under your stewardship for the, uh, for the first time. Planning as we all know, is not only the most uh, exciting, dynamic subject that we all like to speak about, but has the power to be one of the most influential and controversial processes local government has to deal with. It shapes the future of our city, it changes how our neighbourhoods look and feel, and has major implications for those looking to invest in Plymouth's future. Sorry, Councillor Stevens, can I just stop you for one moment? There's something gone wrong here because we should, we've got standards in public life upon the motion that you're speaking to, which isn't the one that I believe you are speaking to. That's what, norm, that's what people normally think of when I do speak, though, Lord Mayor. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, Councillor Stevens. I'm hoping we have no more delays, so I've got to be home for Love Island before, uh, before too long. Right, you, um, may, you may start again, thank you. OK, well... The principle of, of sensible, objective planning decisions is one that's been established in this country, <clears throat> excuse me, Lord Mayor, for generations. We have planning policies that are, quite rightly, heavily, inf heavily influenced by local people, and planning applications are then judged against them. Members of the public are able to have their thoughts heard, in advance of impartial votes. And it's important to stress that despite what a lot of people may say and think, these are impartial decisions taking on the, on the planning merits alone. That balance serves us well. And the fact that party politics is absent from our planning committee under both Labour and Conservative chairs shows it works. And in my opinion, is worth fighting to retain. All that, Lord Mayor, is now in jeopardy, however. The concept of so-called street votes is one that should worry us all. The idea that Plymouth's future should be left to random, arbitrary decisions in an ill-defined and ill-thought-out process doesn't bode well. Because this is about extending permitted development rights allowing more and more development to take place unchecked, undebated, and with no ability to stop it. An arbitrary street vote in favour of a particular type of scheme could allow all of them in a street from then on in. That's been the trend since the current government took office 12 years ago. And how will a street be defined? Who will be able to initiate a street vote? We need 10 registered voters to be able to stand for election, but will there be a threshold for, for these planning votes? Will people be able to vote if they're not on the electoral register? What if someone owns a property but doesn't live in the street? Can the street be split? In Devonport Ward, Lord Mayor, we have Saltash Road with well over 100 and many, many more properties and then we have Harrison Street with fewer than 10. So will all votes have equal weight? Can we have half street votes? What about combined street votes? What about the streets with no residents in them at all? This is a recipe for chaos, Lord Mayor. And it's been opposed by groups as diverse as the Federation of Master Builders, the Countryside Charity, formerly the Council for the Preservation of Rural England, the National Housing Federation, and 
in many ways, most interestingly, the association of electoral administrators. As someone put it quite recently, I can well imagine a situation in which somebody persuades their neighbours in a street to agree to the sort of development that might enhance the value of their houses, but which actually has a negative impact on the wider community and wider neighbourhood. Not my words, Lord Mayor, the words of that well-known left-wing radical, Theresa May. It seems that these street votes aren't supported by anyone who isn't called Boris Johnson or Michael Gove. The government would have been better talking to local authorities, to planning departments, to the development industry, and those concerned about our landscapes and cityscapes. We'd have been a lot better off if they put the energy that's been expended so far into robust planning enforcement teams, which is actually what our constituents really want to see. I think we, do, we all deserve better, Lord Mayor, and I hope we can continue the cross-party tradition we have in this city on planning by agreeing to the motion today. Thank you, thank you Councillor Stevens. Um, Councillor Tui, I understand you're second in the motion. Would you like to speak now or reserve your right to speak? Uh, I'll reserve my right to speak, please. Sorry, Councillor Smith. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. And I fully um, endorse what Bill said about the strength of our cross-party working on planning. However, I'm not comfortable with this motion this afternoon. Um, I don't think it's been particularly well put together and it's actually inconsistent with what the um what councillor stevens own administration decided in cabinet in terms of the representations that they made to government when the planning legislation was being um, consulted on just a couple of years ago so therefore to take an entire motion on notice changes to the planning system and then just pick out one part um, I think is, is not helpful to the city I don't think it's helpful to what we're doing in planning um, across Plymouth the new bill actually says that it is a bill about local democracy, it's a bill about town and country planning, community infrastructure levy, the imposition of the infrastructure levy, environmental outcome reports, regeneration, compulsory purchase of land, information and records relating to land, the environment or heritage, provision of pavement licenses, for example. So I'm slightly concerned, let alone bemused, that the one item in the entire changes to the planning system that has been picked out today is the issue of street votes. And I actually think because of the way we have supported, or at least we've con contributed to planning in the past, and the fact that this title is changes to the planning system, I think we're in danger with this motion of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And that actually, if we do pass this motion today, we're essentially objecting to everything that is being proposed, not just the one thing on street votes. And in terms of the street votes thing, the motion is very premature. And Councillor Stevens has set out his understanding of what is meant by street vote votes. But the reality is that most of us don't know what they're going to encompass yet. So for us to be ruling them out and in it making this entire motion about future changes to the planning system, I think is premature. And again, I'm not comfortable with that. The levelling up and regeneration bill was only introduced to Parliament on the 11th of May. The legislation seeks to enact the government's ambitious levelling up agenda to take the, the whole country forward. Levelling up is a mission to challenge and change location-based unfairness and means giving everyone the opportunity to flourish regardless of where in the country they live, something that in the South West I think we can all say we want to support. It means people living everywhere, living longer and more fulfilled lives benefited from sustained rises in living standards and well-being. And as a city, we have already benefited from some of this money, as has been mentioned this afternoon. The levelling up and regeneration bill itself runs to 338 pages, contains 196 clauses and 17 detailed schedules. Yet, as I've said, Councillor Stevens' motion picks up just the one clause about street votes. So I wonder whether in drafting his motion he's read the explanatory notes because it actually says that the government's not wedded to this idea, that it's in there, but it wants to debate what that actually looks like going forward. So again, this motion is too premature. In other words, the street vote provision of the bill, which might mean residents have a say on whether further residential development takes place in their street, perhaps a hyper-local neighbourhood plan, is to enable further debate to see whether it is retained or not. So again, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. In conclusion, the street vote 
street vote provision has yet to be worked up in detail. It may or may not even remain in the bill and is therefore premature to agree a policy position in this council via the motion on notice until we have seen those details and consider them properly in terms of our excellent joint local plan, our neighbourhood plans and any relationship with how we determine planning applications. As and when we have further details on what a street vote looks like, I am more than happy to continue that cross-party working with Bill and with Mark, Councillor Coker, who I know has the strategic planning oversight. Um, I'm happy to have a conversation about our response, but for now, we can't support this motion because I don't actually think it's constructive and it's going to take the city in the right direction for our future. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor Darcy, and I believe this will be your maiden speech for this term of office. Uh, and I'm delighted. Thank you, Lord Mayor. It is my maiden speech. Uh, here we go. Um, Lord Mayor, I, I rise also to oppose this motion on notice. Uh, I note, uh, first of all, Lord Mayor, that this motion is moved by Councillor Stevens, who I gather has been appointed as the so-called group spokesperson for planning and, and, and strategic planning. It is interesting that it's not been moved by uh, the Shadow Cabinet member for the joint local plan, transport and street scene and climate emergency, Councillor Coker. Yeah. I'm sure if it had been moved by Councillor Coker, who has worked collaboratively both in power and in opposition with Conservative Cabinet members responsible for strategic planning, it may not have been presented uh, in the way it is, are more importantly... Uh, Councillor Darcy, can I just interrupt and say you cannot assume what somebody else may or may not have done. Uh, Councillor Stevens has brought this forward in his role as shadow planning spokesperson. Councillor Coker has a different strategic role, so can you please just stick I'll, to what people have said rather than trying to assume what people might have said? I Thank would you. never assume, Lord Mayor. I'm grateful for that steer, but as I say, it may... But more importantly, I take the view that it's still premature on any analysis. Um, and it is surprising, given Councillor Stevens' experience as a councillor, and more importantly, a former chair of planning. He is in incredibly knowledgeable. I actually benefit of, of a brief conversation outside during tea with him on, on that. But this motion on notion, uh, uh, notice, I I in my opinion, Lord Mayor, does nothing but to serve as a swipe at the government's planning reforms, which have been significantly modified following consultation since the publication of the planning white paper in August 2020. Indeed, we have heard the Labour Cabinet on the 15th September 2020 actually supported some of those proposals, which now appear in the levelling up and regeneration bill, which this motion seeks to oppose. We simply do not know, as uh, Councillor Smith alluded to, whether the provisions of Clause 96 of the bill dealing with possible street votes will make it into the statute book when this bill becomes law. The bill, Lord Mayor, as you will know, is to be scrutinised line by line in the various committee stages. We need to wait to see what parliamentary process comes up before we can uh, properly assess and consider our response trying to make policy on the hoof by way of a motion of notice in this regard is, in my view, unhelpful. It's important we must send well-formulated, cogent representations to Westminster and Whitehall, of course, rather than following a premature let's circle the wagons approach that this motion on notice seems to be uh, advancing. I will say, Lord Mayor, there are elements of this proposal which cause me some potential concerns. And as chair of the planning committee uh, for this year, I will be working closely with officers to keep a watching brief on the situation. And if revised proposals come forward, as the government has intimated, we'll be making appropriate representations, including through our members of parliament at the right time. There is a risk, of course, Lord Mayor, uh, under our current constitution, that any motion on notice in a similar fashion to the one moved today cannot be brought back for six months. This motion is entitled Changes to the Planning System, and I would hate for that premature action to bind the hands of this chamber in future 
but that risk is present now, given the title of the motion. It, it, my um, uh, representations, to quote Councillor Stevens in the motion on notice, that is in fact, it is an ill-considered, ill-thought-out waste of public money for bringing this motion today. And until then, until we hear from the scrutiny stages as that bill moves through Parliament, uh, and we get more detail, um, we should reserve such sweeping statements as set out in the motion on notice. It's not the right message that we should be sending to those in Westminster or Whitehall. And on that basis, Lord Mayor, I cannot support this motion on notice today. I look forward to working with Councillor Smith, Councillor Coker, and of course, Councillor Stevens, a very experienced member of the Planning Committee, and other members of the Planning Committee, Councillor Nicholson, um, and I look forward to uh, keeping a watchful eye on this matter, but Councillor Stevens does not get my support today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Darcy. Councillor Stoneman. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I won't be speaking for long, but I feel I need to speak on this motion. I am rising today in objection for this motion. This motion on the changes to the planning system, as my colleagues have said on these benches, is far too premature and, quite frankly, woolly. How can we, as a policy-making body, be asked to influence our MPs when we do not know what we're influencing? My main issue with, this, uh, with the motion is the cherry-picking by members opposite of the elements that they think will make the final piece of legislation. Things could change, and I am unsure as to why we are voting on the issue when we haven't got the information we need in front of us. Councillor Stevens will know environmental policies will be playing a big role in the changes to the planning system going forward, but this is not mentioned anywhere in this motion. One of the biggest issues facing our population, and they have chosen to focus on policies that might not even make the cut. Councillor Stevens summed this motion up perfectly himself, and I'm quoting, will we? Will we see? We simply do not know. This is Labour all over. Grab a headline, but in actual fact, not know what they're voting for and what they're asking us to influence. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Stoneman. Councillor Nicholson. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Well, just very briefly, and I welcome the contributions by uh, Conservative colleagues on, on this motion. And I think it's absolutely right in that they, what they've said to Councillor Stevens through you, Lord Mayor, and I would echo that, that um, it is premature for a full council debate on this. What, what I would hope, um, certainly my colleague, uh, Councillor Smith, may take on board, though, is that at the time that we knew proposals were coming um, in, in terms of planning reforms, we had set up a series of meetings educating members as to what the planning reforms may or may not bring. And I hope very much my colleague may take on board, as indeed Councillor Darcy has indicated, that, that they may, in their respective positions, um, have a watching brief. But equally, it would be useful not to uh, rely on Councillor Stevens through you, Lord Mayor, to uh, brief Labour members, but for all members of the Council to have a Council briefing by impartial officers on the implications of planning reforms currently going through Parliament. So I hope um, Councillor Smith might take that on board through you, Lord Mayor. Uh, I think what we should be saying today is uh, congratulations and well done to Michael Gove, because his predecessor had intended to move forward substantial planning reform that I think local government were uh, in part objecting to and uh, opposing. So he has come into office, uh, succeeding his predecessor, uh, Generic, um, in terms of actually making changes that are more palatable to local government act and actually trying to, uh, to some extent, streamline the processes. That is to be welcomed. And uh, I would like to see, Lord Mayor, uh, through you, Labour members from time to time acknowledging the response from the Conservative government to representations made by local government, that not all the government does is bad. Um, and I get tired, really, of opposition politicians always criticising government and not actually acknowledging when government actually does listen and make changes. The government should be, we should acknowledge changes that have been made in these revised reforms. They are substantially better uh, than the reforms um, that uh, the previous Secretary of State wanted to do, and that's to be welcomed. Having said that, though, there's probably elements of the reforms that we don't know enough about, and that we should, as a local government family, make representations. I hope very much our Cabinet colleague responsible and the Chair of the Planning Committee will ensure we're all well informed, and that collectively this Council makes representations 
if that's required. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Littleton. Councillor Evans? Uh, thank you very much indeed, Lord Mayor. And uh, can I congratulate Councillor Darcy for being back on the front benches, uh, quite, uh, quite close to the new leader. Uh, I don't know whether it's an indication of uh, closeness to the leaders of the geographical location, but I would like to congratulate Councillor Darcy on the new skill he's picked up since he was last with us, uh, that of parachuting in. And uh, I would, uh, I would, uh, I would very much, uh, very much welcome. Uh, that. I think it's. In, I think that uh, work needs to be needs to be acknowledged. Um, Councillor Owens, can you stick to Sometimes the Sometimes to Councillor Darcy, it is better not to say anything, as your contribution made perfectly clear. Because Councillor Bill Stevens' motion does not presume any foresight at all about how the implementation of the government's intentions in a Queen's speech should be done. Actually, very typically for this government, and ironic that Councillor Nicholson should say this, because the government strategy is announce first and worry about the implementation later. As anybody who had five minutes talking to, Glo <laughs> to Glenda about the state of the elections bill will tell you. But what does this motion actually ask us to do? It says, not to acknowledge Michael J Gove is a jolly good chap because he's not going to do as much horrendous uh, damage to the planning system as Ro Robert Jennick, either in word or deed, did. No, what it isn't about that, what it is about, it's about some first principles for what the council does as the planners of this city. And one of those things is represent the local people. And one of the things that was barking mad, and I couldn't understand it, and I still can't now, is how Conservatives, your currency, electoral currency, is you going around saying to people who want to build literally glass houses that you'll defend their right to do it, or, in the case of the neighbour next door, attack their right to do it. This literally does set neighbour against neighbour. That's what a street boat is all about. And that's not villages and towns, that's every street, every neighbourhood. And that is going to be what you'll be doing in Plimpton and Plimstock and those other areas that you seek to represent for the next 10 years if this bill goes through. So this is not an unreasonable foot in the ground to say, do not cross this line. Because you will be, you will be moderators rather than planners. You will be healers instead of planners. And I think the principles in this motion are all about the things that are under immediate threat from this bill. But they are good principles that we should be defending, irrespective of where the details come in that legislation. So that's all I'm going to say. And all I'm going to say is you are voting to give yourself an horrendous time in planning over the next five years. You'll have to go door to door and say, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Uh, good luck with that. And all we're doing here is putting a foot in the ground and saying, don't cross this line. Because local government is about taking decisions as close to people as we possibly can. What this does, what this does is set neighbour against neighbour, community against community, village against village, town against town. It will happen. You know it will happen. And that's why it's got to stop. Thank you, Councillor Evans. Councillor Allen, and then if nobody else wishes to speak, I'm going to call <laughs> Councillor Tui. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll be brief. Just to follow on from my colleague, uh, Councillor Evans's eloquent speech, all this motion asks is that we call on our MPs to do their jobs as our elected representatives <laughs> and represent us and our communities. And forgive me if I'm wrong, but I thought the role of opposition was to oppose. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. And... Councillor Gosling. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I have to agree with uh, Councillor Nicholson in, um, in his support for the, uh, our MP. Um, Mr. Gove, in, in changing some of these, uh, these planning changes that were put forward. And how did he do that? 
Did he, he listened. He listened to what councils had, had to say. He listened to what planning authorities had to say. And he made changes accordingly. Now, what we're doing, what, what, Mr. Ste what Councillor Stevens is proposing, is that we tell him something through our MPs. We tell him that we're unhappy with this piece of the legislation. We're not proposing to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're just taking the bathwater out. We believe that this part of the street boat Street voting is going to set communities against communities, and it's unnecessary because it removes our ability to plan for our area. So what we're doing is we're telling him that we're unhappy with this part of the legislation before it actually is enacted, and then it's too late. It's pointless us saying when, once the legislation has gone through and it's all done and dusted, back to saying, oh, we don't like that, because it's too late then to make any changes. The best time to make any changes is early on in the process where you have the greatest influence. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make an influence of one part of the legislation that we believe would be retroactive, would be divisive in our communities, and asking Mr. Go, who apparently is very good at listening and does an excellent job, to listen to our concerns and make changes accordingly. Thank you very much, my lovely. Thank you, Councillor Gosling. Um, Councillor Tui, and I think this is your maiden speech too on your return well, to the council. Well, uh, oddly enough, <laughs> the first time round, uh, I made my maiden speech on the first thing on North Prospect, and the second time round, I'm probably going to end up doing the same thing. <laughs> because I read this motion, and I read the page, and I too was asking street votes what are they talking about are they talking about the streets are they talking about the people um and i read it confused i was quite confused for a bit till i sorted it out now bill has covered streets what would happen with the streets the different sizes and so forth i would like to talk about what it might be and how difficult it can be involving the people in all the planning on what goes on in the streets because the people themselves faced with the possibility of their neighbourhood changing, losing their houses, and or their and, and general disturbance can become very difficult to handle. Um, not only can they to ar argue street by street with their neighbours, they can also complain to their councillors and everything else. The things that things are happening are going wrong. Um, and I actually believe in the good. Um, and what the, uh, the planning department in the beginning of this motion says, that is the best way to do it, work it out with a joint local plan, carefully with consultancy. Go on the streets and ask them to help you in for trouble. And I'll illustrate this um, briefly by North Prospect. Um, I lived through the... And that before anybody says this, it was long before I ever thought of becoming a councillor, right? Um... At the beginning of the war, I lost my childhood home, and I never really got another one. I grew up in boarding schools, and anybody who put up with me until I grew in. Thereafter, it was private lets and HMOs. Uh, in 1970, I came down to Plymouth with my husband. We were looking for a place to stay. We had two young children, and the first time I saw the site of North Prospect, I thought I'd gone to heaven. Beautiful little houses, loads of trees on the streets, carpet, and... Fantastic, what a place, and I loved it. A few years later, what do I hear? Basically through the Herald, because it was now the 90s, they're going to pull it all down and rebuild it. And there, there were, believe you me, there was an awful lot of comment on the streets by the people, the people with the votes, the street votes. There were really rowdy meetings, there were arguments up and down the steps, and I was part of it. I was absolutely horrified. And Tudor may remember, he was my counsellor at the time, the times I grabbed him and banged on about the trees and the wildlife and how it had to stop. And I have to say, and that's how I felt, and a lot of people did as well, bar, mind you, somebody who lived down the road who hated the tree in front of his house so much that he banged copper nails into it in the hopes that it would die. However, I was wrong. Tudor, I actually admit now that I was wrong. Community, uh, community education um, taught, taught, uh, training taught me to think about it in a different angle, and it actually became extremely simple. 
because actually North Prospect was built in the 1920s. William Morris ideas, lovely long gardens, people uh, feed themselves, beautiful trees, lovely atmosphere, windy roads, because you've only got a coal cart and a milk float. In the 1990s, the, not only had the situation changed, but the whole era had changed. Nobody wanted that anymore. What they wanted was what they've got now. Uh, the, the paved streets, two cars in front of every house, small, easy houses, easy to look after with little squares of gardens so you can sit out in the evening and have a gin and tonic. And it works perfectly. It was a change of era. And eventually, when people were, it had it explained to them, they got some kind of idea of it, they loved it. But mostly, they didn't. All those people out in the streets were raging for years. But they've all settled down. And there is, I did manage to save, because I eventually, after training, got involved in the regeneration by helping the community. I managed to save about three or four trees in phase one out of about 300. And I leave you with a thought. I've been talking about people's reactions against a possible and a well-performed plan, which is what I believe in. And this, what I've talked about, might not have happened if that had been in place properly. But the end story is the two, our two trees. The one that had all the copper nails in it was hoped to die, survived healthily until it was pulled down along with everything rest. The one, one of the ones I found, I saw it recently, is living beautifully in a concrete courtyard, looking slight but. Thank you, Kirsten. It's, it's shriveling and it's Thank dying. You. you can meditate that in the middle of the night and see which way you're going with this. Thank you. Councillor Stevens, would you like to sum up? <coughs> Be a, be a pleasure, pleasure, Lord Mayor. Um, so, so there you have it. If there's a bit of uh, legislation proposed by the government, you're not allowed to criticise it. You're not allowed to pick it apart and say it might be a bad idea, which is all we're doing today. And in some ways, it's absolutely correct to say we don't have a great amount of, of detail. And... If the government do press on with this, I'll be awaiting uh, more detail with interest to see what, uh, what meat on the bone comes along. But this has been in the Queen's speech. The, that's not an idea that's just tossed around in, uh, in the odd focus group and um, a, 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 a policy planning seminar. This is in the Queen's speech, and we don't know what it means. If this was something that a government I supported had allowed to get as far as the Queen's speech, but we had this, uh, 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 this, this gap in detail, I'd be horrified. And it's not something that I would be able to, uh, able to endorse. The reason that we've seen so many changes in what the government want to do isn't because Michael Gove is suddenly uh, in listening mode and wants to, uh, to consult all the way along. It's because a year ago last Friday, the Conservatives lost the Chesham and Amersham by-election on a massive, massive swing because of the proposed changes that they were bringing forward at the time. And it's political panic that's now sent them in a violently opposite direction with these ridiculous proposals we have now. What we need is a government that treats this subject seriously, in a measured, calm way, not rushing from panic to emergency every single time. And that's what we have at the moment. I make no apology, Lord Mayor, for opposing measures that I think will be harmful. How many times when we had a Labour government did we see Conservative councillors say, I don't like that? That's going to be harmful. We shouldn't do that. And not once, not once did a Labour administration say, you're not allowed to do that. You shouldn't be criticising. Of course we're going to disagree on the detail, issue by issue. That's the nature of the beast. 
but to say we're not even allowed to discuss it, and to bring it down to the title of motions, which, by the way, councillors don't even choose, but are filled in by our democratic support officers, is, is, is absolutely ridiculous. If people think that street votes for planning applications is a good idea, or at least has, have some merit in them, by all means say so. Tell us what those merits are. Tell us what those plus points might be for the future of, of this city. I haven't heard any as yet. And we've had a, a debate in which quite a lot of people with a lot of experience have spoken. And I haven't heard one plus point yet. Not one word of enthusiasm or defense or justification. Because they can't. This is all about, this isn't about protecting the environment or protecting our future cityscapes. It's about protecting conservatives from swings like the Chesham and Amersham by election. That's what this is, that, that's what this is about. And when, and when, when you put party political advantage above the long term sustainable future of our communities, you run into all sorts of problems. That's what I predict. I might be wrong, but that's what my experience tells me. And it's for that reason, Lord Mayor, and many, many others, that I'll be pressing ahead and moving the motion today. Thank you, Councillor Stevens. We will now move to the vote. Please vote using the buttons on your unit. Green for in favour, red for against, and amber to abstain. Thank you. That was 27 against, so that motion is not carried. It is lost. Thank you, councillors. Our third and final motion for this afternoon, 8C, is standards in public life. Councillor Creswell, would you like to propose your motion, please? Sorry. Thank you, my Lord Mayor, members of the Council. We are governed by the Nolan Principles. These principles of selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty and leadership were established in 1995 by Lord Nolan's committee. That committee on standards in public life was set up by John Major in 1994 in response to the cash for questions scandal. These seven principles apply to everyone who works as a public office holder, including those of us elected. It covers civil servants, local government officers, as well as those employed in the police, the courts, probation service, health, education, social and care services, and anyone in the private sector delivering public services. They apply to me as a teacher, and senior education leader, and I took them very seriously, as I know we all do in our role as councillors. Good leaders lead by example. The greater your role of responsibility and leadership is, the greater it is incumbent on you to uphold values and principles, in this case, Nolan. This is one of the key factors in outstanding leadership. It is essential for trust. Hence, 
It is shocking to discover that the Prime Minister's rewriting of the Ministerial Code of Conduct means that ministers are no longer expected to resign for breaches. They can simply make an apology or have a temporary loss of pay. Worse still is that the new look forward to the Code, there is no explicit reference to the seven Nolan principles of public life. And this matters. And this is very relevant to us and those who serve in the public sector. Because if the lowering of standards of probity for those at the top is acceptable, what about the rest of us? We could potentially all be on a slippery slope of falling standards. And even though we aren't, the public perception is we are all the same. Trust in our democracy and public institutions is at stake here. However, I take some consolation that we are better than that, and I'm going to give an example. Some years ago, my husband, Michael Fletcher, having been a long-serving school, school governor, became chair of what was the school's organisation committee. This was a committee charged with looking at school reorganisation. There was a massive rebuilding of schools under the last Labour government. And at the time, the fact was that pupil populations had changed, so some schools had to be closed for amalgamations to take place and new schools opened. Michael served on this committee with councillors and officers, in particular with Councillor John Mahoney. Michael and John worked together very closely and they had to make some really challenging recommendations and decisions. They had to close schools. No matter what the circumstances, closing schools is not popular. However, they demonstrated all the principles of Nolan in terms of this committee being open and transparent with the public. The decisions were made on objective evidence using their integrity. They were never anything less than honest and they demonstrated leadership in the public interest. And their decisions were selfless. In fact, so selfless that the school organization committee actually made the decision to close the school where I was employed at the time. My own experience of that outcome was that I ended up as the acting head teacher who had to see my own school's smooth closure and its amalgamation with another school, who had to reassure parents and carers and children and staff, and remember that all staff, including myself, lost their jobs and had to go through a reapplication procedure whilst working with the authority. All of this could have never been achieved without a massive degree of trust. Trust that only comes if you are accountable, honest and open. That you remain objective and lead in the public interest. And these circumstances, the interest was the children and the local community. I'm grateful to John and Michael and the committee and the council because the outcome was Beechwood and Oakwood primaries and improved provision in the north of the city. Upholding standards in public life is essential if we're to maintain confidence in our institutions. The lowering of the bar of probity by those at the very top, in this case the PM, has the potential to undermine trust in our democracy and public confidence in it. We are not all the same. I've given an example how this council is certainly not the same. Every councillor can give their own example. I'd say to the leader, you're in a strong position to write an appropriate worded letter expressing our concerns regarding the lowering of standards, but also reiterating this council's commitment to high standards and the Nolan principles. I beg to move. Thank you, Councillor Creswell. Um, Lord Councillor Mayor, could I declare uh, an, an interest which I hadn't anticipated the need for? My employers have been mentioned. Um, so could I declare a private interest? It's on the, uh, on the record. As we're talking about standards in public life, Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, may I also rise to repeat that declaration of interest. My current employers were mentioned in that um, uh, speech in support of the motion. Both noted, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Creswell. Councillor Evans, you're second in the motion. Would you like to speak now or reserve your right to um, speak? I think I will, actually, Lord Mayor, if that's all right. You may. Um, so, um, I mean, we had a devil's own job to get here, by the way. We had to rewrite our motion, because apparently, initially, it was pushed back because it didn't, um, it was nothing to do with local government. Uh, and I find that really strange, given the fact that the Nolan principles are all about public life, public bodies, uh, and certainly are a matter for the council. <laughs> Why does it matter how the prime minister behaves? It matters because you take a note and a lean from the top. That's why it matters, and that's why it matters that we should be allowed to discuss it. Uh, so here we are, and I'm going to discuss it. 
And why has Boris Johnson watered down the ministerial code? Well, let's go through, shall we? Because what he's done, of course, is taken out from the front of the document. It's still in the back, but it's not at the front. And these principles, these Nolan principles, should be at the front and center of the ministerial code, not stuck at the back, out of sight and out of mind. And why does Boris Johnson want them out of sight, out of mind? I'm going to go through the uh, Nolan principles of public life. And I wondered if, I mean, we can do a call and response here, if you like. Um, selflessness, number one. Uh, Oldest public office should act solely in terms of the public interest. Uh, actually, the public think, only 2% in a poll I saw this morning, actually think that the uh, Prime Minister uh, follows that particular principle. Integrity. Um, you've got to avoid placing yourself <laughs> under obligation to people or organisations that might try to influence you. Um, only uh, on the weekend, uh, it was revealed that Carrie Simmons, uh, he was trying to get a job for his girlfriend, or his, his mistress at the time, of course, his wife now. And uh, speaking of mistresses, what about the work on Jennifer Akuri, 160,000 quid of public money and free trips to America to plug her business? Objectivity, no wonder he doesn't want objectivity in there. I mean, if you look at the last set of town uh, funding that was given out, 84% of the money that was given out was to Tory areas, uh, to areas with Tory MPs. And believe it or not, despite the uh, state of Parliament, Tories don't represent everywhere. Uh, accountability. Well, that's a funny one, isn't it? Because apart from one member of staff, Allegra Stratton, nobody on the political side has resigned. Oh, sorry, forgot. Lord Get last week. The ethics minister, he resigned, didn't he? Not about that particularly, but he did actually resign. Um, and why did he resign? He resigned because he said, uh, I quit because the PM's readiness to break the law. Right? Uh, openness. Old as a public office, Lord Mayor, should act and take decisions in an open and transparent manner. Information should not be uh, withheld from the public unless there is clear lawful reasons for doing so. Uh, is it, what's the reason for withholding the Russia report, which investigated the behaviour of the Prime Minister in his allocation of peerages and jobs for his friends? Uh, and what about that? And why isn't that out there? Honesty. Holders of public office should be truthful. He lied to the Queen. <laughs> and seven, on leadership. Holders of public office should exhibit these principles in their own behaviour and treat others with respect, says the author of Captain Einsight and A Million Insults. They make Ian Darcy look like Shakespeare. Nolan principles, as I say. Uh, uh, point of order, please, Lord Mayor. In light of what Councillor Evans is actually speaking to, that's an outrageous uh, assertion at my expense. And through you, Lord Mayor, he should be invited to withdraw that and apologise. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Evans, come. Yeah, I shouldn't compare him with Shakespeare. That's right. His speeches can't be compared with Shakespeare. And I've withdrawn Cons it completely. Whatever it was, I offended him by. Thank you. Um, completely. The point Please is, on, on, on the amendment to the, note to, to the Ministerial Code, Boris Johnson has now not placed the code, the standards in public life at the front and centre. He has placed himself at the front and centre of the arbitration of the standards in public life. Who gets to be a minister is his decision. Who goes as a minister is now his decision. He is now judge, jury and executioner on the ministerial code. And that is a power grab that we should all be very concerned about. The point is, he is a power mad, and the Ministerial Code exists to stop people who are power mad from exercising that power in their own interests. We're here today, the most accountable bunch of politicians in the country are our local councillors. And we say that we should have that integrity and that level of accountability applied to the Prime Minister of this country, who should be leading by example, not seeing what he can get away with. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Evans. Councillor Bingley. Th thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I, I have to say I find this quite disappointing. I, th I think the last few months we've raised ourselves up and, and talked a lot about public service and, and, and worked in cross-party way and we, we've 
we work politely and respectfully. I, th I think the, the tone and some of the use of that language was not appropriate for a council chamber and, and contradicts what's actually being pushed here. Um, if you look practically at the motion, um, actually, you know, people have got their private views on what's been going on in national politics the, the, the last few months, and um, some people aren't comfortable, some people are more comfortable. Um, but one of the things that is always true is, is that it's a plague on all the houses, if one has that view. It's not just on Downing Street. And so I didn't want to be dragged down into sort of the, the gutter politics of it all, but just to say, let he who's without sin cast the first stone. Because I'm kind of, you know, it's as if members of parliament up in Cumbria and those in Norfolk and those Labour members of parliament, um, Hartley Paul, Luton North, it's as if that never happened. You know, as, as if it's something that is endemic within our side. And, and I think one of the things I'm proud of about the Conservative Party is actually we're all individuals. And, and when we make mistakes, we, we usually put our hands up and say, OK, uh, we are irresponsible. We are resigning if necessary. So for every Tiverton and Honiton, a Downing Street party, you guys have got what's called Currygate. And you've got what you're dealing with in Hartlepool. And I, I, didn't never, I never wanted to speak like that in, the, in council. I, th I think city politics and local politics is actually above that. And, and Tudor, I mean, Councillor Evans hit the nail on the head when he said that we are most accountable out of all politicians. The reason I don't want to talk like that is because I feel a little bit, a little bit embarrassed in, in, in front of my... I would never knock on the door and want to go into this level of conversation with my residents in Southway. I'm, I, I'm also a little bit surprised in that... Um, we did reach out and try and amend this motion. I don't know if Labour members are aware of that, but we were actually quite happy to run with the vast chunk of this if it didn't say seen in national government, which immediately turns this motion into attack upon Downing Street. We were quite happy to say seen in national politics. And, and, and so that, that, was reject, that was rejected. Um, but the other thing is, there, there's uh, uh, Councillor Evans, former leader of the council, myself, leader of council, um, when we write ministerial letters, we write them every week. Some of them you see, some of them you don't see. But we always write with a real positive ask. And that's why we get listened to. So we ask for free port. We ask for government investment. If something's going wrong with legislation or going wrong with the ambulance service, we ask for that. If we put letters in criticising the Prime Minister in a very singular party political way, that's not going to be great positive message for Plymouth. I think that's a waste of a letter, if I'm honest. I'm quite happy to write letters to the heads of political parties chastising them for the behaviour of their politics. If you so want me to do that, I'll write it to Lord Buckethead, I'll write it to Davey, I'll write it to anyone. You know, if you mandate me to do that. But I do feel this is both... It, it's not focused, it's not positive, it doesn't show the best of Plymouth. And actually, when we do a letter to the Prime Minister, which is unusual, it's usually done across Devon from political leaders... So if we take a unilateral decision to write a letter from the leader of this council to Downing Street, I would want it to be on something a lot more serious than what may or may have not gone on, may have gone on in Downing Street or elsewhere. Um, but I put it to you that we did try in a constructive way to amend this very, very slightly so it was a reflection on all parties. That hasn't occurred, so therefore we will in no way be supporting this motion. Thank you, Councillor Bingley. Councillor Stoneman. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And I apologise, this is the third time you've heard me speak today. So I am sorry, it won't be like that all the time, I promise. Um, I'd first like to say that, as Councillor Bingley said, there are parts of this motion that I agree with. We should all be held following the loan and principles. I think everyone in this chamber would agree with that. But one thing I cannot stand by and listen to is the Labour Party opposite there talking about our Prime Minister, breaking the law, doing this and doing that. Your leader is under police investigation in Durham. So is your deputy leader under police investigation for breaking the law. Now, you know, why wouldn't you want to write a letter to the leader of your party to say, why, why, why are you still where you are? Why aren't you following the principles of honesty, integrity, lawfulness? Why aren't you doing that? It's critical. Oh, OK, so when the Labour Party then were having a go at the Prime Minister before the police investigations took place, that wasn't innocent improvement until proven guilty. It wasn't. And 
that everyone knows that. Everyone knows the Labour Party and the way in which they behaved. Uh, thank you, councillors. Councillor Stoneman, would you like to continue? Thank you, Lord Mayor. And I would just like to say there are a number, as Councillor Bingley has highlighted, a number of uh, MPs still in Parliament who were elected as Labour MPs, admittedly, they might not be part of the Parliamentary Labour Party, but as, for example, in Leicester East, she is, Claudia Webb is still an MP, after I would say breach pretty much all of the Nolan principles. How is that integrity? How is that honesty? It isn't right and it isn't fair. And I think for this motion to have not been uh, agreed to be amended by the party opposite really highlights the fact that there is one rule for them, one rule for another. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Sturman. I don't think anybody else has put their hand up to speak. So, Councillor Creswell, would you like to sum up, please? This was really about the leadership, about the ministerial code and leadership, and therefore the impact it has on all of us. And I think I made it very clear in the way I spoke is that how I feel that we are very much, and I think um, also Councillor Evans made it very clear, that we are very much um, fulfil both the, the actual rules of the, of, of the Nolan principles and we also fulfil them as far as spirit is concerned as well. And I think I gave a good example of that. I do sympathise with the position you are in on the opposite side of the chamber because it must be very uncomfortable to go up against the very values that you, I know that you all hold really dear. Defending the indefensible is actually never going to be easy. But failing to support this means that you are defending the indefensible. This is specifically really about the Prime Minister. We align ourselves to the lowering of probity and to the lowering of high standards in public office. You risk bringing everyone, ourselves, yourselves, everyone, down. We are undermining our confidence in public institutions and underlining, undermining the very essence of our democracy. And we risk this because I don't believe that you have that much faith in your prime minister as such. Um, you feel that you have to defend him for party political reasons, just because he's your party leader. And I understand this is very difficult, it's very hard, but you do need to do the right thing. We are in a position where our party leader, and I hadn't mentioned, um, I hadn't mentioned in fact, uh, many of the anything other than the ministerial code, but our party leader has made it very clear that if he is fined, he will in fact be resigning. This is all greater than the individual. None of your previous prime ministers, and I'd have big disagreements with them, but none of your previous prime ministers, from Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, to Theresa May, can you imagine them breaking the ministerial code or doing anything naughty? From Heath, to major, this is not party political. It is about standards. It's about standards in public life. It's about high standards of behavior and leadership. Let's just remember again the Nolan principles. Selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, honesty, and leadership in the public interest. And I think, as Councillor Evans has made quite clear, it would appear that our present Prime Minister, unlike any other Prime Minister, seems to have broken quite a few of them. Outstanding leaders, and the most senior you are in terms of leadership, outstanding leaders lead by example. They lead by good example, and they lead in all aspects of public life. I will say again and stress, we are not all the same. You are not all the same. When I say we, I mean all of us. We are not all the same. It's really important that I have reiterated that, but we are specifically looking at the ministerial code, the rewriting of it by a prime minister for his own ends. Vote for this motion to prove that you are not the same, we are not the same. I beg that you support this motion today. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Councillor Creswell, for summing up. We'll now move to the vote. Please vote using the buttons on your unit. Green for in favour, red for against, and amber to abstain. Um, that motion was lost. Um, thank you, Council. I now move on to item number nine, urgent decisions. There were three decisions made, which I think, Councillor Bingley, you're going to just speak to the floor on, please. The, the, the urgent decision, I, I just they are as, as read, basically, Lord Mayor, thanks. Okay, does any other councillor wish to speak? No. That's fine, thank you, Council. Can you please just note the report? Now, the bit I always used to love, questions by councillors. We'll now move to item 11, questions by councillors. Can I invite members to ask any questions of the leader, cabinet members or committee chairs? Please indicate you would like to speak by raising your hand and I will call you to speak. Please note that there is a 45 minute limit of questions on this session. Can I ask cabinet members particularly when you are responding, please don't turn around to respond to the person who asked the question, but place forward so that you still speak into your microphone so that people online can hear. Questions should be no more than one minute long and answers no more than two minutes. And members may ask one supplementary question. This is not about making a statement which must be related to the original question they asked and the same restrictions apply. So, I'm going to say Councillor Churchill because you were the first person I saw. Didn't see anybody else. I'm trusting that my two advisers here are making a list. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, my Lord Mayor. I think uh, actually Councillor Tuffin was in front of me, but I will take the question anyway. <laughs> um, Lord Mayor, my question is to Councillor Dreen, um, and through this question, I am thankful and grateful for his uh, update on electric vehicle uh, energy points, charging points, um, and I know electricity and water doesn't mix, Lord Mayor, but I'm wondering if he's considered the uh, maritime uh, industry at all. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, yes, we have. We have two EV water taxis in the city at the moment, and the pontoons are uh, having, they have charging points on them, and it's something we're looking to try and do more of in the future, uh, but it's obviously small vehicles at the moment rather than large. Thank you. Um, next on my list is Councillor Tippetts. Uh, thank you, my Lord Mayor. My question is to the Cabinet Member for Transport. Um, uh, in Compton, uh, there are lots of roads that have seen no attention for over 20 years now, and one of those are Hartley Avenue. Uh, it looks more like a beaten farm track <laughs> Excuse me, than um, an actual residential street, so would he and the transport officers come with me to look at this road and see what can be done to make the lives of residents better? Yes, certainly. Um, obviously, there are different sorts of surfaces. Um, I'd need to see that one in, in person with the officers, but more than happy to come for a site visit and see, see what we can do, uh, depending on the depth of them and uh, our intervention levels, but happy to come and have a site visit. Thank you. Councillor Singh. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, my question is to either the Leader of the Council or Chair of Taxi Licensing. Uh, just wanted to find out what plans uh, either of them may have if more and more licensed drivers decide to be licensed outside of the city. 
Can you just ask one person that question, please, Councillor Singh? Because you need to decide who you want to reply. I'm not sure who's responsible. Probably the leader. Probably the leader, then. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, the, it's, it's important to say there's been a lot of cons consultation around taxis and the provision of taxi service. Uh, and, and we have just sort of talked about that earlier. Uh, what, what, I'm, what I asked for as chair of the Brexit Infrastructure Committee last year is, is that we look holistically at the service per se in terms of its contribution to the infrastructure and moving people around Plymouth. And, and so I would hope that that would be absorbed within that scrutiny process this year. We, we agreed to set up a select committee and that was uh, minuted and that is in the scheme of work that I've seen, I understand. Uh, the, the chair of the scrutiny committee is now infrastructure and growth, growth and, and that will be cha chaired by uh, Councillor Riley. So if you could, could you, I can raise it with him or you could raise that with, with Councillor Riley to look at that part of the process within the overall select committee this year. But I think that's where we best encapsulate it, if, if that's okay. That's the thing, okay. Um, supplementary, Lord Mayor? Yeah. So uh, my supplementary really is, are you aware of what's happening in York? Sorry. I'm sorry. I, I didn't catch the end of that. I'm not sure that that's linked to the original question. Um, I think you've had a response which is sending it back. So can I suggest that you direct that in writing to Councillor Ridey and Councillor Bingley? Is the leader happy to accept the information that I've received from York in regards to what's happening? I, Councillor Singh, thanks for raising that. I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to. Uh, I've, I've said before that I really want scrutiny to ask harsh questions of the administration, and by asking those hard questions, we get the better answers. But it, I, I appreciate it. it needs to be brought into the process of scrutiny, otherwise we're just looking at things random. Uh, so if we can bring it into that select committee process over the next year, that would be helpful. Any information you have is, is most greatly received. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bingley. Councillor Tuffin. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. My question is to Councillor Wakeham. As Cabinet Member with the responsibility for recreational and environmental enforcement, do you believe that our children and citizens swimming in the sea should be as safe as possible? My Lord Mayor, absolutely I do, Councillor. Thank you. Supplementary? Supplementary, please, Chair. Will, will you therefore back our local MP, Luke Pollard, uh, to campaign to have the waters around Devil's Point and Firestone Bay designated as an official bathing water, subject to regular testing for water quality? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. In actual fact, uh, it's not just that particular area. The uh, waters that come down through the plim need testing as well. And I certainly would back anybody who wants to propose to improve our local waters. Thank you, Lorna. Councillor Allen. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Uh, this question for Councillor Wakeham. After walking around various parts of the city, not least my own neighbourhood in Peveril, which I'm very proud to represent, I've been noticing the state of the weeds and the overgrown grass in both the streets and the back lanes. And I just wondered what has gone wrong with this year's programme? Our residents deserve better. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Well, as you probably gather, we have diverted a few uh, resources because obviously we've got a manpower crisis, quite simply, and uh, also financially, we're uh, perhaps a little poorer than we should be uh, in this area. But what we're doing is looking at uh, converting some of our road sweepers now, uh, so they will actually chop the weeds off. And this should be happening fairly soon, but I can't give you an exact date, but I will certainly update you when I know more about this. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Councillor Nicholson. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Question to Councillor Patel, please. Um, 
I am disturbed over the last uh, few weeks to have had three residents all raise similar issues in relation to the customer services section within the council, where they've had council tax and housing benefit issues, all of which have had standard letters threatening to withdraw the, month, the option to pay by monthly uh, instalments. Uh, would Councillor Patel agree that that's it's not the way to treat customers of our city approaching the council by sending them threatening letters either on the first or second reminder when actually uh, some of these issues have been computer systems issues and nothing to do with the residents? So will he seek to review those standard letters that are coming out to customer services to ensure that they treat our customers with respect? Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Bingley, yes, of course I will. I, I will get this looked into. Uh, <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> Councillor Nicholson. Sorry, Councillor Nicholson. Uh, thank you for that. I will certainly get this looked at. Uh, I, I agree with you. It is not a situation that we should be in. Uh, and I will get a review carried out straight away and, and, and see what the problem is. Thank you. Councillor Deacon. Thank you, Lord Mayor. This is a question to Councillor Pat Patel regarding Cell GP. It was estimated that over 20,000 people saw the event last year with a global audience of millions, bringing in millions um, for the economy of Plymouth and showcasing the city in all its splendor. So are you supportive of the idea to bring Cell GP back in 2023? Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Deacon, uh, that's a, a very good question and, and one which currently we cannot answer. We have to look at the economic data that comes back from this year's uh, sale GP and, uh, and make a decision based on that. Councillor Hendy. It's a question for the leader. Um, something has been brought to my attention the last couple of weeks. There's been a few reports of taxis leaving the city centre and they won't do multiple drops for females, they're, they're actually complaining about the cost of fuel. So what they're actually doing is if they're leaving the city centre, they won't go to Beacon Park and then to Southway, they're doing an individual booking. So they're actually going to Beacon Park as one booking and then going back to the city centre to, to start the um, clock again and do another drop. Can you ensure us that this will be looked into? Because we're looking at the safety of our residents. We've got females being left in the city centre or other residents as such. This practice can't, can't continue. Can you assure us that this will be looked into, please? Councillor Hedy, th thanks for raising that. And, and uh, let's, let's be clear, I think I'm on the record of saying repeatedly that um, despite so many good people working in the taxi sector here, the, the quality and delivery of taxi provision in this city is well behind what it needs to be com and compared to other cities. So um, in terms of safety, violence against women and girls, uh, you know, one of the priorities is obviously to mass massively look at the public transport system that will include taxis. It's absolutely not right, the scenario that you're describing to me. However, in order to take that forward, I, I do need a little bit more specific information uh, away from the full council chamber if, if, if you could provide that because if it's sort of specific scenarios that you've got or or reference numbers or, or people that you know are responsible then we can chase that up if, if it's a general generic issue and problem then what we can do of course is put some messaging across sort of all, all, all taxi service deliveries but but I think you're suggesting something that you you've got sort of more specific information where we can look at off-grid basically and, and a and assess that. Uh, just coming back, you've prompted me to say something ar around the, uh, not just to, to do with the violence against women and, women and girls, but the, we will be having a, a, essentially a, a, violent, a violent sort of crime audit around protection and safeguarding, because that is well overdue. And within that, I, I am meeting with the chairs of licensing and taxes uh, to, to see what more we can do through the licensing process uh, although we need to have those processes uh, delivered with integrity, uh, that there, there surely is a policy steer or an extra policy steer that we can give to provide not just assurance but safety to people that are using those services. But uh, be under no illusion, I, I'm completely and utterly aware of how 
serious public safety issues are, are around related to not being able to get a taxi, particularly through uh, nighttime hours in Plymouth, it's not acceptable. Thank you, Councillor Bingley. Your time it. is up. Councillor Coker. Thank you, Lord Mayor. My question is to Councillor Drain. Councillor Drain, around the city, the signage and white lines, uh, yellow lines, is becoming a real, real problem. Um, have you identified the reason behind this? And actually, why is it taken me nearly 18 months in an accident black spot to be able to get double yellow lines replaced? Thanks for the question, Councillor Coker. Um, to deal with the lining situation first, um, since the end of last year, as the service director knows, I've been going on about the quality of the white lining in the city and also the yellow lines as well, bus stops included. Um, and so we, this week, actually, we've got a second crew undergoing training with South West Highways, so we will have two crews going out in the future to, to try and catch up on that. Some of the major problems we've got on the major roundabouts, North Cross roundabout or Manadon, as an example, I'm really sorry to hear that it's taken, uh, did you say 18 months for a, uh, some double yellow lines? I'm more than happy to look into that if you want to send me the details. That sounds an awfully long time. As long as it was agreed and passed in a TRO, it should have happened. But if, if, as long as that's the case, um, I'm look, I'll look into it for you. Supplementary, Councillor Coker? My, my supplementary, Councillor Dreen, is that actually I'm told it's on a list and it's on a list and it will get done. And this is the problem about a list that there seems to be a list of roadworks, lineage and signage that needs doing, but that list is not made public. So you have no idea how long it's going to take you. And the problem is the residents that have reported this issue are the ones then that are saying, well, councillor, you've done nothing about it. And when I say it's on a list, they look at me as if to say, well, surely on a list, you know when we're going to be done? So can we kind of look at that and try and take that positive list um, nature forward? Thank you. Yeah, I'm absolutely happy. I've got no problem with sharing when something's been reported. You know, we all know at the moment, you know, highways will be, a uh, defect will be done within 28 days and, and, you know, you're responded to. So I've got no problem with sharing that. The service director's at the back there. So we'll take that forward. Thank you. Councillor Evans. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, my question is on trees and streetlights. So it's difficult to separate these. Who wants trees and who wants street lights? That's why <laughs> we'd like to know. I, I'll ask you, all right, if that's okay. Um, so um, as uh, we're wandering around Ham Ward, um, we're having a look at the state of trees. A uh, number of constituents are contacting us about their terror uh, of the proximity of very heavily laden trees knocking on their windows. That's how close they are. It's not the responsibility uh, of, the, of the person who lives there, it's the responsibility of the people who owns the trees and they're not being done. Um, similarly, in parts of North Prospect, um, we have so few streetlights and it's beginning to be a problem because the trees are overhanging the streetlights and actually not, I mean, many parts of North Prospect are dark uh, and I, given the... Councillor Evans, you need to be very precise with your question now because you're out of time. OK. Uh, can you sort it out? <laughs> I, need, I need a magic wand, Lord Mayor. Uh, in actual fact, I'll do my very best. Uh, I've got to say that uh, trees are inspected on a regular basis, so that, uh, it doesn't seem like it sometimes, I know and uh, defects should be noted. So I will pass this on, uh, Councillor Evans, and hopefully get back to you, or you can get back to me if you prefer. Thank you. It, they're on the forever list, and, and the point is, I, I'd really appreciate if you and I could have a little wander around and I can show you. I'd also like to show you Riverside Business Park, which was uh, something that we gave, the council gave to the Devonport uh, crew for running industrial development, and the roof, there's two trees there that are tearing the roofs off Riverside Business Park. All right, now that's a community-led 
business park and it needs sorting out. It's our responsibility. So these things are a matter of urgency and it's no longer good enough to hide behind there. There's our ash die back. We've got a problem with staff. You need to prioritise getting staff who can deal with this. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd be uh, willing to meet you, uh, Councillor Evans. So if you email me, we can make an appointment in our diaries and I'll be happy with that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Leverage. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Um, my question is to Councillor Wakeham. Councillor Wakeham, as you know, some holidays are, are coming up now, and I would like to ask, can we make it priority that children's play areas are cut more frequently? Thank you. My Lord Mayor, thank you, Councillor Leverage. In actual fact, we are reviewing this, and we will constantly review uh, at the end of the season, we'll be looking at many things when it comes to street cleaning, trees and grass verges, everything else. So we will be covering the lot. OK, thank you, Lord Mayor. No supplementary, my Lord Mayor. Councillor Lang. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, my question is to the leader of the council. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm glad to see that our Gloucestershire based councillors have made the effort to make the 160 mile journey to be here today. Councillors Burden and Collins said in a recent statement that they're constantly looking to ensure how they can serve their residents properly and when it becomes clear they cannot, they will sit down and consider their options. Can you tell us how you're monitoring their work and how you're reassuring yourself that they are serving their residents in Chadlewood and Moorview properly? Will it be case workload? Will it be public opinion? Would you share with us what it will take for you and them to decide their position is no longer tenable? Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Lang. And, and uh, the scenario is not the first time that Plymouth City Council has experienced this scenario, but I will not betray private conversations with any individual member on my side uh, with anybody else outside of our group. Suffice to say that uh, Councillor Collins and Councillor Burden have been very proactive. Uh, they have been good, positive councillors. Uh, Councillor Collins, again, has made a very positive uh, suggestions in council today. Uh, I, I'm fully confident that they are doing their job as councillors. Councillor is a community role. Uh, they are doing, uh, they're attending meetings. They are doing casework. We have different dynamics going on in the group in terms of group policy formation and they're carrying that out so apart from that I, I, I am comfortable with the situation as it is thank you so if after next May you have two new Conservative councillors somewhere in the city would you be happy if they too then move within months of being elected at least 160 miles away <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Lord Mayor. I, I think earlier on we were being chastised for, for speculation into the sort of medium and longer term, so I'm not going to get into that now. Thank you. Councillor Hume. Uh, thank you, my Lord Mayor. Um, um, a question to Councillor Jonathan Dream, Transport, and um, sorry, apologies for that. Um, I'd just like to ask a question about the ongoing problems with pavement parking and if there's any movement on legislation, because I understand in Scotland and obviously in London, it's prohibited to park on the pavement. So is there any more clarification? Because it's uh, an, an on day for me and my um, casework file for people complaining about pavement parking. And I mean, cars fully parked on the pavement. I don't mean a couple of wheels. I mean, when you go in, 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 in the area that I represent, there's cars fully on the pavement and, and disabled people and, and, and people with chair, um, push chairs cannot access the pavement safely. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for the question. I share your frustration. I, I think probably every councillor in, in the ward has, has probably got roads where we suddenly find wheelchair users or mothers with pram in the road because there are cars on pavements. Um, it's something I'm constantly asking the team can we chase this? Can we talk to our MPs? Can we, can we try and get a steer on it to do better? Um, 
I, I, I'm hoping that it's going to be coming. Uh, I, I obviously don't know when. That's a, a decision from Westminster. Um, but certainly, we're, we're out there trying to do what we can and ticket cars if, if we can on there. Um, I'm not happy about the situation. and I'm, I'm sure everybody else has the same across the board. All I can say is I will keep trying to do better with the team to see when we can get some, some leeway for, on the legislation from, from government to give us the powers to do it. Have a yes, of course, um, supplementary. Uh, thanks for the question. It's just that when it, it's, I don't want to make this a casework file question, but when I raise this t in, in, in the casework team, it, it, I'm, I'm told there's nothing they can do about pavement parking. So when the cars are parked on the pavement, I don't see that there's a, a, t a ticket issued, and then I get told where well, the car's gone. But then when I go back up because the residents contacted me, the, pe the car's still there. That's, that's, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Thanks. I, perhaps I should have clarified. As long as it's crossed double yellow lines and it's on the pavement, then yes, we can issue a ticket. If there's no lines there, then, then we can't. Um, but the team know that we need to look at this because when you, when you see people in wheelchairs, families in the middle of the road with a pram or something and someone's there, the, the, the driver naturally assumes, why are they in the middle of the road? But you can see because there are cars parked on the pavement, why? We are trying to do our best. Um, we're, we're trying to get the, the powers and legislation down from London, as I say. I will go back again and, and see if, we, if there's any time lanes or further information, and I'm happy to share that with you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Dream. Councillor Wheeler and, um, is next. And just to let you know that I've still got a list of six councillors, so if you haven't put your hand up, you need to do it quickly. Thank you, Lord Mayor. <clears throat> a question for uh, Councillor Dreen. Um, following the very disappointing news that uh, Plymouth was to receive no funding for our uh, bus service improvement bid, how are plans progressing for the provision of services from next October, please? Thank you for the question, Councillor Wheeler. Uh, the team are looking at that at the moment, and they've been in consultation with both operators locally to see how we can move forward. I've also been in contact with uh, Johnny Mercer as well about services in the north of the city to see if he can make representation to Department of Transport to see if we can look at this again for the city. Supplementary, Councillor Weaver. Uh, yes, please. Uh, from the, the last comments, does that mean that there is still the prospect of some funding? And uh, if so, our, our plan... Uh, is, is the, uh, the current plan still being progressed? Or the plan that was, the bid plan, is that still being progressed? I need to check that because the person that's dealing that with is not around at the moment, I'll be honest with you. Um, we are, I'm trying all avenues to try and improve the bus services in the city. Um, and I've asked, is there any additional funding with Johnny Mercer, the MP, via obviously, and that, that's, that was what my comment was referring to. Um, but plans are progressing talking to both operators at the moment about services in the city in the future. Councillor Singh. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, question is to the leader of the council. Just wanted to find out what the, or whether the process of the public consultation for the road signs going back up uh, to Jack Lutterley Square has started or not. I think the clarification is for signs around John Hawking Square, which I, th you mean, I think so. <coughs> Carry on, Councillor Bingley, sorry. Th thanks, Lord Mayor. Uh, I, I know it's a hugely interesting topic for members of council and, and prior to me being elected and many of us being elected in here that council passed a motion essentially uh, calling for the name to change pending a public consultation uh the, the position has not changed under my leadership uh the the, the, the matter sits with the courts and until that's concluded i, I really can't say anything uh in in the public council at the moment thank you thank you uh, councillor sorry supplementary lord mayor if it's about the fact it's still in judicial courts then i don't think there will be a supplementary but it's ask it but i might rule it out 
Yeah, just tell me if I am. Um, so just in regards to road signs, uh, before the season starts, will the road sign around Home Park uh, be set up before the season starts and before the staff? This is a different up? question, Councillor Singh, so uh, I'm going to roll it out. Uh, yeah. Councillor Collins. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm worried that, I'm turn that this is all turning into Councillor Dream question time, but I'm going to add to it, I'm afraid. Um, if it was possible, would you be able to have a look at what can be done with, the ro with certain roads, particularly housing estates, where the tarmac hasn't been laid thick enough so that we can't actually get a pothole repaired because it will never, ever meet the standard required? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question, Councillor Collins. Um, yes, again, as the service director knows, we've been looking at this for quite a long time. Many, many councillors have sent us emails about roads that don't in meet the intervention levels, etc. And I've said, well, what can we do? There must be something we can do. We're, we're looking at, at the options. Um, we're hoping to do some trials on roads that don't currently meet the intervention level because what I don't want to do is I don't want the team to go and repair some some holes that are only 20 mil deep, as an example, whereas the intervention level, as I'm sure you all know, is 40 mil deep, and then it come out within a short period of time, and then everyone's going to say, well, that was a waste of time. So we, we are looking at this. It's a, it's a, it's a citywide issue, um, and we're hoping to do a trial on, on a road shortly to see if that does work and how long it works, and if it does, it is the potential that we might be able to roll that out. But it's very early days, and we need to do a, a trial first. Councillor Tuffin. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, my question is to Councillor Shayer. Um, as Cabinet Member with responsibility for corporate estates, do you believe that we should maintain our public facilities in order to keep them safe and avoid future costly repairs? My Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you very much for Councillor Truffin's question there. I certainly believe that it is our responsibility to maintain our corporate property. Supplementary, please. Supplementary. Thank you. Um, we have been promised that the tidal, um, the tidal swimming pool at Firestone Bay would be repaired for the past two years. Uh, we've now been told that it will be next year. The seawall is getting closer to breaching. And when will you do the urgent work the council has promised, which would already have been completed? And um, it's worth mentioning that your leader today quoted um, uh, this particular ward as being the most deprived ward in the city. And this is a resource that people need. Um, so. Are you likely to give us a guarantee that you will get onto this immediately rather than put it off for another year when it's likely to deteriorate and cost a lot more money to this council? Thank you. Through yourself, my Lord Mayor, to Councillor Tuffin, I will inquire as to when that is going to be repaired. Um, it is an area where I've got many friends who also use the bathing facilities down in Firestone Bay. It's keen to me to keep everybody happy, especially in that area. So I will inquire as to when it's going to happen and push forward a programme as quickly as I possibly can for the repairs. Thank you. Councillor Bridgman. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. My question is to the leader, Councillor Bingley. Um, will you continue to work hard on manifesto item and commitment number 54, as this was the manifesto you were actually elected on, and give it your highest priority, please? Thank, thanks, Lord Mayor. I, I, can I ask you, is that around the airport or is it something else on the... What's 54? Sorry, I don't know them all. There were 86, I don't know them all by a list. Through you, Lord Mayor. I am the airport lady, what else would it be? Yes. Commitment number 54, the largest strategic asset in the city. Um, we didn't quite get there, but we nearly did under Councillor Kelly, so I want your full reassurance that you will make it your highest priority, please. Th thanks, Lord Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Bridgman, uh, for clarifying. Uh, I thought it would be, I just didn't want to automatically assume. The, the, the situation is as it was a few weeks ago uh, in, in that, we, well, from 2021, we had a manifesto equip, uh, commitment to uh, 
uh, reacquire the land, uh, and we went into negotiation with the leaseholder. Uh, I can't comment further on that. Suffice to say that the priority is for us to succeed in negotiations with the leaseholder, and that there is a condition on that land, uh, way, way predates our time, that it should be used for aviation purposes. I'm and the team is fully committed to that. Uh, Plymouth transport links need improving. Uh, we are, we're talking about high value jobs, we're talking about getting massive investment in, and, and there's now serious engagement around four or five very, very sizable companies. Uh, it is to our benefit, all of us, to have an, an airport or an aviation service operating within the city, so completely committed. Is, is it my top priority? I want to be honest with you, say it's, it's a core priority. Uh, often when we talk about ambulance services and, and the rest of it, think, things there are sort of crises that, that crop up. But I, I'm absolutely accelerating this as fast as possible, but there, there is kind of a commercial and a legal process that the predis my predecessor was under, and I'm too am under that. But absolutely, yes, you're right for asking the question, and yes, it's core priority for this administration, and yes, we are fully committed to the manifesto commitment. Thanks for raising it. Thank you, Councillor Bingley, through you, Lord Mayor. Um, that's appreciated. It will be music to many of my residents ears. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Rennie. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm not sure which cabinet member to direct this to, so I'll go to you, Leader, and if you can direct me to the right person, please. Um, a couple of months ago, we were called in by residents in Tees Hill, right, with a lot of antisocial behaviour that was going on. They were concerned, right, that actually someone could get hurt. And at the time, right, we had the police and everybody else involved, and they were saying they were going to do all sorts, but because of resources, it wasn't helpful, well, to help all the time get all things sorted. Anyhow, yeah, what's happened as a result, unfortunately, recently, we've had a serious incident where a person driving along on a bike has been seriously assaulted. And we've been asking, right, whether or not the residents, whether or not some sort of CTV system we can put in, can you actually, yourself or a cabinet member responsible, give us some assurance that you could meet with the councillors and possibly organise this, please, as a priority? Because, honestly, someone could get seriously hurt. Councillor Rennie, th thanks for raising that. Uh, be, be under no illusion. Uh, a, another core priority of this administration is to make the city and its neighbourhoods, all of them, safe and within legal parameters provide high quality up-to-date CCTV that is coordinated across the city, that is integrated with the police services, other safeguarding agencies, and of course, us as a local authority. Um, we're quite good in this space anyway. I have to say, I, I have since becoming leader, uh, sort of, I have asked questions around CCTV provision and, and seen some of it myself. Uh, we have had meetings with the police, uh, including around uh, sort of the, the, the key recovery group and the aftermath there. Uh, what, what I'm not satisfied with at the moment is that we've got a coordinated strategy that can implement the Violence Against Women's Commission and, and a wider tackling violent crime strategy. I think, if I'm honest, that, that needs modernising and needs updating. It needs to take into account some of the technical capabilities there are out there now, which are a lot cheaper and a lot more powerful than they were even two or three years ago pre-COVID. Uh, I'd like to meet, meet with you on this. Uh, and what we can do is perhaps get a little team in place and specifically focus on this issue and maybe use that as a maybe a best practice or a pilot for something wider within Plymouth. But thank you so much for raising that, definitely. Lord Mayor. Thank you, um, Leader. The reality is very simple. As I said, it's been escalating, so can we make this a priority, please? And obviously, myself and my two colleagues would be um, pro um, to be joined into this, please. Through you, Lord Mayor, if, if we can book something out in the diary rapidly, absolutely. And we would do that on site. Is that the suggestion? Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Poyser, your maiden question. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, just a quick question to uh, Councillor Wakeham um, on the hot topic of uh, green space management. Um, like many councillors here have received comments and feedback from their residents. I uh, just wondered whether there'd be an opportunity for councillors and residents to feedback in a constructive and orderly fashion on suggestions that residents may make about particularly grass cutting, uh, areas which are left for nature and also potentially wildflower meadows. Um, and also uh, if there's an opportunity for residents to get involved in becoming active in managing those areas as well. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, councillor. Yes, I would say that uh, we will be reviewing, as I said earlier, uh, how the grass is cut and how the wilding is going uh, at the end of this season. We will obviously take into consideration any comments that you have now. Uh, I certainly, for one, 
want to see as much wild in the area as possible. And uh, I want to make sure, and I've said this is one thing we need to explain to the public, that we have appropriate signage, especially on the entry points to this city, because a lot of people still do not appreciate biodiversity. And that is something that we've got to educate certain members of the public on. And not being ages, because I'm quite old myself, but uh, we need to make sure that older people understand it, because it is the older generation that don't seem to appreciate the problems that we have. And we've lost so much land around the city, and obviously we all know about Sherford, and therefore, you know, we need to make sure we've got the wild in areas to perhaps try and compensate for that. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Wakem. Um, just on, on that, uh, I think um, anything we can do, appreciate your support on that, anything we can do in terms of um, how do we constructively feedback at the end of the season, some timing around that, um, for your due consideration would be very welcomed. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Ian. I will certainly be talking to you in the near future. Thank you. Hey, I've got eight minutes left. I've got three councillors. So I'm going to say be very, very short and concise with your questions and answer, please, so I can get through my list. So the next one is Councillor Coker. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm not sure if I can be very short and concise. My question is to Councillor Wakeham, but it concerns Councillor Dream. As we're going around the city at the moment, there's a lot of wildlife growing and plant life growing out of the drains and gullies. Um, and I know you've seen some of my tweets because that's come back to me. Um, what kind of um, liaison, what kind of um, progress are you and Councillor Dream making to join highways and street scene and waste to be able to work productively instead of separately tackling this major issue? Thank you, Councillor Coker. We are, in actual fact, working together. I'm fairly new in this post, but uh, already Councillor Dreen and myself have actually been out to get more appreciation of what's actually going on in the street, and we certainly will be working together to do our utmost to combat the problems. And I understand that, uh, obviously, there are a lot of wild in areas which are taking place on the streets, but we will control them. Uh, I think I said earlier, we've got, uh, we're looking at uh, what are street cleaners really, swingers, which are being adapted with special cutting mechanisms. So hopefully in the future, we won't be so reliant on manpower. We will be able to get out there and do it a lot, lot faster. And uh, obviously I look forward to that day because regardless of political parties, I think we all need to work together on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Councillor Wakeham. Yes, I agree. We all need to work together. But my question as being an opposition spokesman and a local Devonport councillor, and you as the cabinet member, when are residents in my ward going to actually see some action? Because I cannot go around and log every drain. And you've seen some of the pictures that I've sent. So when are my residents going to see some action on their streets? Well, I have, uh, Councillor, uh, I think I have, I have a meeting later this week and uh, we will be discussing this very issue because obviously it's something that's of great concern to me. I mean, I drive around now and I've never really looked around like this the way I do now. I see weeds everywhere and I'm a very appreciative, but as I said, the climate now in the southwest and um, with climate change is so perfect for this problem. And, you know, we have to do whatever we can to fight it, and we will be. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wakeham. I've got two... I'm going to do questions, but no supplementary, so I can get the last two people in. So it's going to be Councillor Singh and then Councillor Tuffin. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, there's two pressing questions, but I'll, I'll stick to the one, I think, which is ward-relevant. Um, this is Cabinet Member for... I don't know whether it's street scene or enforcement. Um, previously, I asked around CCTV, covert, uh, in the ward where we've got a hell of a lot of fly tipping. Uh, my question is whether or not this administration is going to invest in any more cameras 
and are we going to operate zero tolerance in this city, especially when we're welcoming visitors from all over the world, whether it's LGP, whether any of the big events that we have in the city, but more specifically for the residents in the Drake Ward, what can I go back and tell them? Thanks, Lord Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Singh, and thanks for a very good question. Uh, I, I don't really want to use phrases like covert or overt on CCTV, but I, I, I get your drift. Um, I, I, uh, I am a big fan of having modern uh, web-based CCTV that cross-communicates with businesses, with the local authority, with police as much as possible within privacy regulations. So the, the full gamut of technology and CCTV I'm, I'm in favour of using for law enforcement and enforcement processes. I'm unapologetic about that. It makes the city safer, not just in terms of fly tipping, but in terms of wider law enforcement. Um, so yes, I, I want this to be a city that harasses fly tippers. I want it to be a city that harasses people that park badly across pavements and block uh, block young mums and dads walking their push chairs. I want this to be a city that targets and is hostile to repeat offenders and a, target, a, a city that is hostile to people that uh, conduct violence against girls and women and everybody. So uh, it is within the thrust of things. How do we do that? I, th I think we, we get together a uh, cross-party task force or something like that that targets uh, crime and enforcement and we get the police involved in that. And from there, we work out an implementation plan and, and part of that, uh, of course, I'm sitting down with uh, Councillor Smith every month to, to implement the, the recommendations of violence against women and girls. Uh, but I, this stuff has to be integrated together. Otherwise, we're just working in silos and, and we may be hitting targets in one area but not succeeding elsewhere. But that's a very good question and we'd love you to be part of that. Thank you. And the final question then is, I don't think Councillor Singh wants a supplementary, is Councillor Tuffy. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. My, council, my question is to Councillor Bingley. Um, a lot of the residents around Plymouth, all over the city, complain about noisy exhausts, and we're aware it's a police issue. So would you be um, representing us with, to the police and ask them to look at this problem and actually prosecute people for it? Because at the moment, that doesn't seem to happen. And also... Um, would you be willing to support our local uh, MP, Luke Pollard, and indeed our own councillor, Pen 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 Penberthy, I beg your pardon, Deputy Lord Mayor, um, to cite one of these noise cameras, which I'm told are available in Southside Street, although I recognise it's a citywide pr problem, but um, our local MP has started a campaign and it would be really welcome if you could join that. Thank you. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Uh, and and uh, again, Councillor Tuffin, uh, I, I don't know quite, I don't know how to elaborate other than to say yes. Uh, I, I saw what uh, Luke Pollard, the MP, uh, was saying in the Evening Herald of Plymouth Live a few days ago. And I, and I was saying to my wife, absolutely, that is spot on. Where is this technology? Uh, we, we, we need that. Um, the uh, Council of Pemberthy as well, obviously, we, we can... I, I th we will make investigations around this technology and see if and how we can acquire it, basically, and then, I think, roll that out as a couple of test areas because there's some complaints in some areas and not so many complaints in, a, in, a, in others. But, um, yes. Thank you. Well, thank you, councillors. Um, I think we managed to get in 23 councillor questions then, so well done for the speed. Um, so that includes the business of full council. Thank you, members, for your time and engagement, and I wish you all and those watching a very good evening and hope you all stay safe and well. And it's six o'clock, and we've still got lots of evening light left. Thank you.